All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition of the Global Reality right here on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. I'm your host, Josh Reeves. I thank you so much for being here with us today for the broadcast. This is the Tuesday, December the 2nd, 2008 edition of the show. Going to be coming to you live here for the next four hours with a ton of news and information to get into on the duration of the four-hour broadcast today. If you would like to join us, the number to get you on the air today is 360 3501486 and uh, we'll be happy to get you up in on the air with us today during any part of the broadcast. Oh, man, what a horrible day, way to start the show. Uh, very interesting story right here I got to talk about. This is it, uh, just straight against when you wake up today and you see this one. Uh, very interesting stuff. Jeb Bush says GOP can't be the old white guy party. We got a clip um, uh, and says that uh, the government says they should create a shadow government and focus on policy. Hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? A shadow government. Huh? Jeb Bush calling for a shadow government like we don't already have one. Huh? Well, isn't that just special? Well, so we'll, uh, we'll we'll talk about that here in a minute. And, and what first thing I want to do right out of the gates is play, play a clip. Russian analyst says U.S. will collapse with secession and civil war in 2009. He's saying that states like Texas will secede from the Union. There'll be civil war. Uh, very interesting stuff here. So I'd like to play this clip for you right now. Here it is. Across the globe recently, indeed, the turmoil originated in the U.S. And a Russian professor of economics has put forward his own theory about the impact the credit crunch will have on America. Joined in the studio now by Igor Panarin, who says the U.S. will split into six pieces because of the crisis. Let's talk more about this. Uh, good evening to you. Thanks for joining us in the studio. Uh, quite controversial thoughts, these. Explain your thought process, sir. I believe that in 1998 I was writing my theory. It has to do with the fact that, first of all, different states of the United States have different history, different culture, and different level of financial and economical significance in the life and activities of the United States. Today I believe that the world is uh, at the point of United States development when in fall of 2009 there may uh, a huge crisis may develop and eventually it will lead in summer of 2010 that the territory of the United States will be div divided into six different states. My immediate thought is do you think this would have happened may happen according to your theory if it weren't for the financial crisis and if this scenario did happen where would the power base be? Well, the main power base, there will be actually three power bases on the territory of the United States. New York and Washington, which will be under the influence of London, first of all. It's California and Texas, which will be under the influence of three countries, Russia, China, and Mexico, from my point of view. Now, uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel says the U.S. got into this trouble in the first place by borrowing cheap money and using cheap money. Do you agree with her? I believe that she's right. First of all, I can emphasize that Russia and Germany often have uh, the same points of view as far as the financial crisis is concerned in particular. But I also want to emphasize that the problem is that the dollar is not backed by gold, and uh, there are too many dollars in this world. Well, well, Mr. Panara, what are your forecasts uh, for the outcome here in uh, Russia regarding the financial crisis? I believe that the crisis in Russia uh, can be finally prevented only with uh, making the ruble the main reserve currency of Euro-Asia and turning Moscow into the main financial center of the Eurasian continent. Just very briefly, I just want to also pick up on something you said in your report that you even speculated uh, this scenario that Alaska might want to renew its ties with Russia. Why is that then? I believe that Alaska should uh, return to Russia, and there is a very good manager, Roman Abramovich, who has been really successful in managing Chukotka, so I believe that he will manage with uh, ruling Alaska as well. Okay, Mr. Berlin, it's really good to hear your, uh, let's say, rather different views tonight on the program, but good to see you in the program, nevertheless. All right, so there you go, a very interesting clip there. Sorry about that, i, I, I got to tell you, I had somebody walk in the damn studio room with me uh, right when my intro is going, and uh, that really just completely threw me off my whole show here. Uh, when somebody walks in the room when you're trying to do a show, it's very, very annoying. So uh, 
yeah, that's <laughs> that's why the intro got botched there. So I apologize for that. You know, if when if when when people don't care and they're more preoccupied with their own crap, you know that that's what happens. So, um, anyway, nonetheless. But uh, so yeah, I mean, so there you go. I don't know if there's any truth in that. I I don't really know. At this point, I don't even really care. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm here, but whatever. Uh, uh, that's uh, yeah. So there you go. Uh, I don't. You know, Russia wants to bring us down. Uh, they're our enemy. Uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a uh, is is you know solidifying itself as the new power. America's going down in flames. Uh, get used to it. I don't really know what else to say. Uh, there you go. Uh, Jeb, Jeb Bush says GOP can't be the old white guy party. Former Florida governor says create a shadow government to focus on policy. Well, there already is a shadow government to focus on policy, Jeb, and you're a part of it. It's called the Council for National Policy. So you already got one. Jeb Bush says the Republican Party needs to adapt in the wake of wide-ranging defeat in, in the election and move beyond its traditional position as the old white guy party. The former Florida governor told Newsmax correspondent Ashley Mertella the Republicans should create a shadow government to challenge Democrats on policy grounds. Well, again, you already have. In Washington, we need to show humility and be the loyal opposition. I actually think we need to organize ourselves in the form of a shadow government and make it based on policy, not partisanship. I mean, so there's a clip to this, and, and I don't know how they, let's, let's listen to this clown talk about this. I want you to actually hear him say it, not me. So one of the things Republicans need to do in Florida, and certainly nationally, I think, is to go back to the blocking and tackling and not assume that you can just pontificate. you got to do the hard work. That means grassroots organization. It means listening to the base of the of the of the means voter registration. It means turnout operations. It means recruiting candidates that look like the population we're trying to attract to, to, to our cause. Uh, those, those things seem to have waned in the last couple of years. Minority, overwhelmingly for yeah. Obama, in the high 90s as far as black uh, voter turnout goes. Now, granted, he was the first black presidential candidate. That's but right. uh, having said that, what do Republicans have to do to gain back some of the minorities that they had in the past and lost this time? Well, w with African-Americans, we need to remind them of our shared values. The best example of, of that is the proposition that uh, carried with a sizable majority in California related to protecting the sanctity of marriage as, as, a, as a union between a man and a woman. Um, that was supported by over 60 percent of African-American voters, and yet Senator Obama carried the African-American vote in California and across the country, as you said, by over 90 percent. So we, we can't ignore uh, large segments of our population and expect to win. We can't be the old white guy party. I mean, it's just it's not going to work. The demographics go against us in that regard. Among Hispanic voters, I think we need to change the tone of the conversation as it relates to immigration. Uh, in Florida, we've not participated much in the chest pounding and the yelling and the screaming and the, I mean, that just, it drives me nuts when there are substantive policy differences that we can show mutual respect on, but the tone needs to change uh, and root more candidates for that, that share our values in the Hispanic community. In Florida, we've done that. In my last election, I carried 60 plus percent of the non-Hispanic, I mean, the, the Hispanic uh uh, Democrat vote and you know, 90 percent of the Cuban uh, vote and most of the Republican Hispanic vote and it was a significant reason why I won re-election. There's no reason why you can't attract Hispanic voters. President Bush showed it as well, uh, but you can't do it if you're turning people off just by the the, the way you say things. At the recent uh, RG, I mean the Republican Governors Association meeting. A young crop of Republican governors coming up say basically rebuilding the party is our domain. It's got to begin with us. As having been a governor twice yourself, um, does that make sense to you? Well, it, it, it does to a certain extent. I think that there are three things the Republican Party needs to do. In Washington, we need to show humility and be the loyal opposition. I actually think we need to organize ourselves in the form of a shadow government and make it based on policy, not on partisanship. 
Um, people are sick and tired of the partisanship just for partisan sake. But they aren't um, sick and tired of a loftier debate about, about policy. And the Republican ideas, once expressed, um, are the right ideas. So I would, I would suggest that the Republican D.C. section would be playing defense, if you will, and, and reminding people that there is a difference and do so in a way that's focused on policy. At the state level and local level, there's much that we can do to advance our cause. And I think there it is correct that we should be playing offense and we should have a passion for reform. We can't be Democrat light. We can't just get along. We have to actually be proposing solutions to what appear to be intractable problems as it relates to education, health care, infrastructure, uh, across the board, there are ways that we can show that we are truly on the side of the people that are concerned about the future of the country without abandoning our principles. And there, you know, Governor Jindal is a great example of a, of a governor who is leading by example and has a passion for reform. That should be the model across the country. All right, so there's Jeb Bush saying that uh, the Republican Party should form a shadow government that sets policy. Well, you and your Council for National Policy buddies there, Jeb, have already uh, effectively done that. So I think it's interesting that, you know, he'll say that we, we should do something, which they've already done. And he's talking about, you know, oh, well, we didn't try going after the black vote. Well, you guess what? Your Uncle Tom, Alan Keyes, who, who's also a Council for National Policy member, hasn't been didn't get getting the job done, is he? I mean, my goodness. That guy, he's like, oh, hi, hey, I'm Alan Keyes. How's it going? You want to talk about no soul whatsoever. My goodness. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, he's linked to, look, you know, you do some research into Jeb Bush. I mean, Jeb Bush has come up in, uh, in my research on the CMP many times. You know, especially when it comes to uh, fundraising scams and, and uh, voting machine rigging. I mean, goodness. Unbelievable stuff. Uh, there's a group called Response Dynamics. Yeah, look into Response Dynamics. Uh, they exist for on only one reason. They, oper they operate turnkey scams for CMP clients that target vets, the elderly, and others. They receive a percentage of all contributions and Clients include Gary Jarman and uh, the Ridden Newers. And uh, one of the things that, uh, about Gary Jarman is that he's a major uh, client, a CMP member, specializes in uh, Social Security scam letters. And uh, I mean, these guys were major fundraisers for the, for, for the Bush, uh, two, two Bush terms. And uh, Jeb Bush was in, 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 uh, involved with that. In addition, he runs several other companies and so-called charities out of his home in Alexandria, Virginia, such as Christian Voice, the Jarmon Consultants, the U.S. Cuba Foundation, American Cuba Cause. And uh, Jarmon is directly linked to Bush, Jeb Bush, Tim LaHaye, the Reverend Sung Young Moon, the John Burt Society, Newt Gingrich, and has been operating scams with Gary Jarmon since at least 1998. So these, and I mean, all this stuff is, is voluminous. It's there. I mean, you know, and of course, then you've got people like Jack Abramoff. <coughs> so it's just, I mean, it's, it's one big scam after another. And these are the people that use their wealth and their connections and their influence and their power to rig elections. And they also use their wealth and their influence and their power to throw elections. That's what people don't understand. They can't wrap their head around that. People cannot wrap their head around why vast amounts of money would be spent by the Republican Party to intentionally put in someone to lose, not someone like John McCain. Because they don't understand that both the left and the right were infiltrated long ago, and this group, the Council for National Policy, I'm making a film about, is the key group in which the socialist infiltration on the right took place. So they put tons of money behind people like McCain and Palin. So they will intentionally lose so they can get the next big socialist in there, folks. No, that's hard to understand. More on the other side. 
Tuesday edition of the Global Reality. Stay with us. All right, ladies and gentlemen, back here with you on Global Reality on this Tuesday, December 2nd, 2008 edition of the broadcast. The Global Reality on this Tuesday, December 2nd, 2008 edition of the broadcast. Thank you for being with us today for the show. If you'd like to join us today during any part of the broadcast, 360-350-1486 is the number to get you up in on the year with us today for the show. Tons of news and information, as usual, to get into today on the broadcast. And, uh, yeah, you know, just it, this is the thing is, and I've seen people on message boards, some of these uh, people that are just in love with the, uh, the, the patriot paradigm that try to deny uh, the information, the research that I do, that I've done on the Council for National Policy. It, it's just so ridiculous. I mean, it, the, you know, you didn't hear your hero, uh, your cult of personality deity talk about it, and I wonder why that is. So uh, obviously it can't be true. Well, guess what? When we get these films out, we're going to prove to you that it's true, and we're going to shove it down your throat. How about that, you little punks? So you can run your mouths on the message boards, and you can do all that crap you want to do, and just love your little patriot movement, your little, your little fed infiltrators, and all that crap, and all your people that work for these globalist think tanks. I'm just sick of it. And every last one of these criminals is going to get exposed in broad frickin' daylight, and I don't give a damn if it brings down the whole patriot movement. How about that? Put that in your pipe and smoke. Because this group was funded and founded by people that are tied to racist eugenics groups like the Pioneer Fund, the Heritage Foundation, the National Center for Ethnology and Eugenics based out of Edinburgh, Scotland. See, I've done my research. You haven't done yours. You know, you just want to sit back and deflect and say it's not true because you don't want to accept that it's true. And you certainly don't want to accept that you've got the, you know, it's so ridiculous. You'll hear some of these patriot type radio people get up and say, oh, they're, they're, they're the new age movements infiltrating the patriot movement. And Michael Tassarian and David Icke and all these other guys are infiltrating it and are infiltrating the patriot movement. And, but yet they don't even know that the patriot movement was, was started and created by people that are into, into new, into new age and, into theosophy. I mean, my goodness, you know who the number one fun, funder of the Republican Party has been for going on 30 years now and who has funded, given the most money to the Council for National Policy? The Reverend Sung Young Moon of the Moonies. How about looking into the Scientology connections? And every, you know, every time I start talking about the Scientology connections to the Council for National Policy, my show starts getting messed with. How about that? How about getting into that? How about how... Uh, Phyllis Schlafly and Beverly LaHaye were giving money, uh, were, were funded and helped fund the, the anti-evolution uh, teaching in California schools. How about that? Guess what they replaced it with? They replaced it with Scientology teachings. Yep. Don't believe me? Go look it up. Type Council for National Policy Scientology in the search engine. You'll see what you find. So, you know, the, you little Kool-Aid drinking patriot lovers out there uh, who love all your little cronies, just go ahead and keep on loving. And I'm sure even when the film's out, that there will still be people that will try to, to, to deny and everything else as they always do. But the time is coming where the old guard is, is going to the wayside and the new guard's coming in. So, you know, you, you just best get out of the way. And I've seen, tell you, I, but I, it just pisses me off because I've seen a bunch of these clowns on these message boards. With, it's all they have to do all day is sit on message boards. They don't actually do anything. They don't actually go out and, and like, uh, you know, attempt, like, start a radio show or anything themselves. They just like to sit on message boards of other people's and uh, talk about, talk trash on what everybody else is doing. Real, real, uh, real brave type of stuff there. Uh, you know, and this is that that's the problem. And again, you know, it's going to be a minority of the minority that even actually get, gets off their asses and does anything anyway. The rest are going to sit on the sidelines and sip Kool Aid, which is exactly what we've got going on right now. But, uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, look at all of this stuff. I mean, you've got, 
I mean, if you, if you go to a search and type Reverend Doomsday, the, the Reverend Doomsday article uh, that came out in January 28, 2004, very telling. I mean, talking about how, you know, what Tim LaHaye started out, what he was, you know, this John Burt Society uh, conspiracy theorist that talked about the Illuminati and all this stuff. I mean, the guy's a 33rd degree Freemason. Go look at any of his books. Babylon Rising. Some of these other ones that have Rosicrucian uh, symbols on the front of them. It's controlled opposition. These people create movements so that grassroots movements don't start up in their place. That's the whole point. That's why this network is, is considered a threat because we're grassroots. We've broken away from the established movements, and that's a problem. Are people still trying to drag us, kicking and screaming back into it? You know, and I feel like it just won't have it. <coughs> and I, I've seen a lot of people lately Come, you know, coming in the chat room and, you know, still thinking that this is old school Patriot Radio or something. Well, it's absolutely not. You know, and just because we have, you know, some a few hosts on this network that may have, you know, been associated with that old paradigm does not mean that this is some continuation of, of, of some of these other older Patriot networks. So get that out of your head as well. You know, we've got people here that are trying to take things to the next level. We've got people here that are understand that have been trying to get away from it. But, uh, you know, those of you that can't handle it are still attempting to bring people back into that old paradigm. Well, the old paradigm's done. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll sit up here for four hours and talk about the CMP if I want to. I mean, if that's what I want to do. And you clowns and all the message boards and all that are not going to stop me. So... Uh, that that's the whole thing. That's my whole point. Is again, you've got uh, the line in the sand is drawn, and I've I, I've really come to the conclusion that the m- m- majority of people don't want the whole truth. They want a version of the truth that is convenient. Or they want a, a a version of the truth that's comfortable for them. But if you go past that line of anything that's comfortable or anything of what they consider to be acceptable within their controlled form of reality, well, then here comes the psychological resistance every time. I mean, you got to throw everything away. you got to throw everything you thought about anything. That includes what you found out once you got into this new paradigm, you know, of being quote-unquote awake. You'll find that you're not any more awake than you ever were. You're still asleep. More on the other side, folks. Tuesday edition of the Global Reality Stewards. All right, ladies and gentlemen, back here with you on the Global Reality on this Tuesday edition of the broadcast, I'm your host, Josh Rees. I thank you for being with us today for the broadcast. Lots to talk about, lots to get into today on the duration of the show. And, uh, you know, I was putting these some links in there, and I, I got a lot more. I just, I, I just didn't have time to get to them, but um, I'll definitely, uh, I, I mean, you can, if you want, if you have questions about the Council for National Policy, you have, uh, you want links or anything, you can email me at globalrealityshow at gmail.com. I'll be happy to give you uh, as much information, as many links as I can give you. Uh, with information on the group. Again, all this stuff is there. You know, what's interesting is a lot of this information um, that I've found, it's very interesting. A lot of this information is 20-plus years old. There's a great book out there uh, by a guy named Russ Ballant. Russ Ballant, B-E-L-A-N-T, Russ Ballant. Uh, Michael Bell and Doug Owen have actually had him on on their show on the Intel Strike Report. I need to get him on myself. Uh, he wrote a book called The Coors Connection. Uh, and it's all about uh, the Council for National Policy and the connections. And, you know, I mean, this is a guy, I mean, this book is, I don't know how old this book, a lot of this information is 20-plus years old, but, uh, I mean, this guy will tell you all about the connections through the Latin American death squads with Larry Pratt and, uh, uh, and you know, the Center for Strategic International Studies. I mean, all of this stuff. I mean, these, these people, I mean, you've got, uh, you know, you, you've got tons of... Uh, various people that are involved in all these groups. I mean, it's unbelievable stuff. And you've got the Pioneer Fund. And the Pioneer Fund, uh, you know, I mean, look, 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 let me, let me, let me just give you a, a list of some of these people. You've got Phyllis Schlafly, you've got Larry Pratt, you've got Paul Craig Roberts, you've got Rome Corsi, you've got, uh, 
uh, tons of them. I mean, you, but, uh, I can't remember all the rest of them, but you've got these people who sit at the same table as uh, people like John Ashcroft and, you know, Dick Cheney being the keynote speaker. But the key thing about the group, the most important thing, even beyond just the fact that, you know, I mean, the, the two main aspects are is, number one, you always see these connections. To, I mean, the, the, the same people that funded the Council for National Policy are the main funders of the John Birch Society. The Hunt Oil family, based out of Dallas, Texas, here where I live. And, you know, these are the, I mean, folks, these are the people that uh, that put the wanted for treason posters of, of, of JFK in Dallas, Texas, on November 22nd, 1963. You've got, I mean, there are, you've got Knights of Malta members in this group, 33rd degree Freemasons, Opus Dei members. Christian Zionists, you've got people like, you know, Hagee, Pastor Hagee, Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell when he was alive. You've got all these people. These, this group meets three times a year in total secrecy. They have, you know, even the Bilderberg Group, folks, releases their membership lists. This group does not release their membership lists. They're held in total secret. And... The interesting thing is how when you look go look back at, at the funding on it and how the Fabian socialist movements created the group as a pretext to infiltrate the Republican Party and the, the right as a whole. And this is what they've done. This is why you've seen. Why do you think that you saw Bush do all these socialist tendencies, all these things, nationalizing banks and all this stuff. That's because, folks, once they got control of the Republican Party, they were able to bring in socialism on both sides of the political spectrum. That's what the world international system is and the whole new world order is based on is socialism. And it started with Ronald Reagan. And all, again, all this information is out there. You can go look into it and find it out for yourself. A, a critical piece of information unearthing the dark origins of the Council for National Policy is the fact that Nelson Bunker Hunt, financier and executive officer of the Sumner Institute of Linguistics. By the way, that, that Sumner Institute of Linguistics is here in Dallas, Texas. I'm going to go shoot, film, shoot video at it for my film. Uh, the Religious Roundtable, the Campus Crusade, and the John Burt Society, and the main funder and second president of the CMP and Jesse Helms, whose top political oper operative, Tom Ellis, was director of the Racial Eugenics Pioneer Fund and the second CMP president. They were also members of a Racial Eugenics Society, the International Association for the Advancement of Eugenics and Ethnology, the IAAEE, -E, which is headquartered in Edinburgh, St Scotland, established a branch of the U.S. in the U.S. through the personal agency of Lord Malcolm Douglas, a member of the British Cliveden set, which supported Hitler during World War II. Now look into the Cliveden set. This is part of the Milner's Roundtable, the Rhodes Scholars Milner Roundtable that came out of the London School of Economics. Now if you read Carol Quigley's Anglo-American Establishment, he talks all about the Cliveden set, all about the Rhodes Milner's Roundtable. That book is the blueprint for world international socialism. Lord Malcolm Douglas Hamilton's deceased husband, part of the British aristocracy, was the brother of the host of Rudolf Hess. When in 1940 Hess made his secret flight to England, Hess, a top aide to Hitler and Nazi Party officials, sought to meet with British aristocratic circles known as the Cliveden Set. Sympathetic to Hitler's war aims, the Cliveden Set tried to get England out of the war and it declared against Germany in September 1939 after Germany invaded Poland. Hess was arrested and imprisoned after Lord Malcolm Douglas came to the U.S. He established an American branch of a racial eugenics group headquartered in Scotland. The oil billionaire Hunt Brothers and Senator Jesse Helms are members of this group. It is headed by Robert Gayer, who published the <coughs> Racist Mankind Quarterly until Roger Pearson took it over in 1978. For an overview on race and intelligence, Murray and Harrison recommended two books by three Pioneer Fund recipients, Audrey Chewy, Frank, C.J. McGurk, and R. Travis Osborne. McGurk is the main authority they cite to prove that IQ tests are not racially biased. He was one of the scientific mainstays 
of the segregationist movement in the southern U.S. And in 1959, McGurk and Shuey became leading members of the International Association for the Advancement of Ethnology and Eugenics and first publisher of the Mankind Quarterly. Other members included Senator Jesse Helms <coughs> and the oil billionaire Hunt, Hunt Brothers. Carol Quigley's Anglo-American establishment identifies the Cliveden set as the British elites who later formed the Rhodes Milner Roundtable. Cliveden was the home of Lord Astor, a decisive voice in the Milner group. And these people set up a branch of them. And again, Russ Ballant in his book, The Course Connection, he goes into a lot of these uh, Nazi connections and whatnot. I mean, this is this is why you have all of these people. And you, you, look, you realize that when Pat Buchanan ran his campaign for president in 96, the, you know the reason his, and Pat Buchanan's also a member, you know the reason his, his campaign was brought down because it was because of his uh, affiliation with Larry Pratt and all these white supremacist groups. So, I mean, all of this stuff is, is there. You can go and find all of this information out for yourself. And we'll, we'll talk more about this, but this is, this is very key information because this is the point in which, I mean, anything that's connected to the Rhodes, Milner Roundtables, the Cecil Rhodes, Cliveden Set, London School of Economics, anytime you see anything like that, folks, it is a branch of socialism. And that's what's, that's another thing people can't wrap their mind around. They can't wrap, wrap their mind around, you know, a, a group being socialists that predominantly are in the media and in independent media and everything else blaming everything on socialists blaming everything on communists see they can't wrap their mind around it. again these groups are started to quash any grassroots movements from ever starting more on the other side tuesday edition of the global reality right here on oracle broadcasting i'm your host josh reeves Stay back here on the global reality on this tuesday edition of the broadcast i'm your host josh reeves i thank you for being with us today for the show and I want to continue talking about, uh, you know, we, you can you can go find out all this stuff about the Council for National Policy yourself. You can go search. You can go do research. You can go, you know, find old membership lists. You can go dig around. You can go, I mean, you know, do about, spend about an hour or so out of your day sometime and go research and go find out all this stuff. What I'm talking about right now are these uh, connections to the, the, you know, the secretive groups, the roundtables, and uh, how this group was founded whole cloth by the Fabian Socialist Movement. During this period of almost 60 years of 1889 to 1940, the society has been known by various names. During the first decade or so, it was called the Secret Society of Cecil Rhodes, or the Dream of Cecil Rhodes. In the second and third decades of, of its existence, it was known as Milner's Kindergarten from 1901 to 1910, and the Roundtable Group since 1920 has been called by various names, depending on which phase of its activities was being examined. It has been called the Times Crowd, the Rhodes Crowd, the Chatham House Crowd, the All Souls Group, and the Cliveden Set. The late Walter Lippmann was not only a member of the Mount Perlin Society and of the Council on Foreign Relations, but also of the American Roundtable. Walter Lippmann, George Lewis Beer, Frank Adelette, Willis Shepherdson, Thomas W. Lamont, Jerome D. Green, and Erwin D. Canham were a part of the American delegation to the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 after which they founded the Council on Foreign Relations with members of the British Roundtable. So you see, this is this is another one of the very interesting things, is they always try to say, you'll see people that, that don't really know much about the Council for National Policy, and they'll say, well, they're, they're a, a right-wing version of the Council on Foreign Relations. That's one of the, I just, I hate it, drives me absolutely bat crap crazy when people say that. Because that's not really true. It is and it isn't. Because they were founded by both. Both groups, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Council on Na for National Policy, were both founded by members of the British Roundtable. The Cecil Rhodes Milner Roundtable, the Fabian Socialist Movement. And, and, and in some cases, you have Council on Foreign Relations members and Council for National Policy members in both groups. Thomas Lamont was chairman of the Anglophile J.P. Morgan and Company in 1926. Lamont secured a $100 million loan from Mussolini. His successes as fascist dictator of Italy and aggression against Ethiopia would inspire Adolf Hitler. The Morgan partners subscribed to an idea expressed by Walter Lippmann in 1915 that U.S. foreign policy would experience a crowning disaster if uninformed by a vision of Anglo-American future. Quigley acknowledged the Roundtable's appeasement policy dating back to the Treaty of Versailles. 
Those who are familiar with the activities of the Cliveden set in the 1930s have generally felt that the appeasement policy associated with that group was a manifestation of that of the period after 1934 only. This is quite mistaken. The Milner Group, which was the reality behind the phantom-like Cliveden set, began their program of appeasement and revision of the peace settlement as early as 1919. Jesse Helms, who was also linked with the Knights of Military Hospital Order of St. Jer Lazarus of Jerusalem, which was founded in Britain by Robert Gare, publisher, publisher of the Races Mankind Quarterly before Roger Pearson, the Order of St. Lazarus was also established in the U.S. by Lord Malcolm Douglas of the Cliveden set. In the 1960s, a Briton named Robert Gare had succeeded in founding a branch of the Order of St. Lazarus in Great Britain, accepting many non-Catholics as members. The, name, the same Robert Gare was involved when an International Commission on Orders of Chivalry was created with the main purpose of providing legitimacy to the Order of St. Lazarus. The Duke of Nemours decided to open the order to them, but this led to another split, and Nemours was himself deposed and replaced by Duke de Brissac, who in 1980 abandoned the denomination of the order and gave the association new statutes, calling it simply Hospitallers of St. Lazarus. Lady Malcolm Douglas Hamilton is related to a British family that supported Hitler's war aims. When she and her husband came to the U.S., he helped establish a branch of the military and hospital order of St. Lazarus of Jerusalem, an obscure racist-led network based in Scotland and tied to Jesse Helms. Of course, Jesse Helms was a 33rd degree Freemason. He recently died this year. Scholars examining the relationship between right-wing politics and racial research have drawn on a 1979 work by social psychologist Michael Billick, Psychology, Racism, and Fascism, which argues that the origins of racist and neo-Nazi movements of the 1950s and 1970s are to be found in British social science. Robert Gare's Mankind Quarterly is based in Edinburgh, Scotland, the location of the Order of St. Lazarus. Since it was established in 1960, the Mankind Quarterly has had the same overall editor, Professor Robert Gare, a physical anthropologist trained at Edinburgh University. He was formerly professor of anthropology at the University of Sangor in India, but now is a resident at Edinburgh where the Mankind Quarterly is published. Gare contacts with the British fascist came to light when five members of the Racial Preservation Society were prosecuted in 1968 at Luz under the Race Relations Act for publishing racial material. At the time of the offense, the Racial Preservation Society was an independent body. By the time of the trial, it had officially merged into the National Front. It was not by coincidence that the cloning of Dolly the Sheep occurred at the Roslyn Institute in Roslyn, Scotland, located seven miles south of Edinburgh. Situated directly between Roslyn Institute and Edinburgh is Roslyn Chapel. The famous shrine of the Knights Templar is, that is geometrically designed as a copy of the ruins of Herod's Temple. Near Roslyn Chapel is home of the St. Clair or the Sinclair family, which have historically been revered as prominent Freemasons of Britain and a sacred family of the Merovingian bloodline. The esoteric interpretation of Dolly compares with the white sheep to Christ, whose divine and immortal state of racial eugenics hope to duplicate through biotechnology. According to news reports, the cloning of the first human embryo occurred in 1999 on June 24th, which is the Masonic feast of St. John the Baptist, patron saint of Freemasonry. Roger Pearson became chairman of the World Anti-Communist League. And the World Anti-Communist League was the precursor to the Council for National Policy. Roger Pearson became chairman of the World Anti-Communist League and was responsible for flooding European chapters with Nazi sympathizers and former Nazi SS officers. Searchlight credits the Pioneer Fund under the direction of the second Council for National Policy president, Tom Ellis, with financing the work of numerous Anglo-American race scientists such as Pearson. Indeed, most of the leading Anglo-American academic race scientists of the past several decades have been funded by the Pioneer Fund, including William Shockley, Hans Eisnick, Arthur Jensen, Roger Pearson, and others. But the Pioneer Fund's importance in the history of post-war race science far exceeds its size or the size of its grants. With almost laser-like precision, the Pioneer Fund has been at the cutting edge of almost every race conflict in the United States since its founding in 1937. An article in the New York Times on December 11, 1977, characterized it as having supported highly controversial research by a dozen scientists who believe that blacks are genetically less intelligent than whites. The fascist ideologist Roger Pearson, whose Institute for the Study of Man has been one of the top pioneer beneficiaries over the past 20 years, is the clearest example of the extremist ideology of the fund's leadership. Pearson, who published the Mankind Quarterly, and Robert Gare, who served on the editorial board of the Heritage Foundation's Policy Review, is a Briton who obtained his master's degree at the London School of Economics. 
The London School of Economics was founded in 1894 and financed by the British Fabian Society as a long-term investment to educate and train an elite workforce to carry out the schemes of socialist reform. The London School of Economics is now one of the largest schools of the University of London and it has an international reputation. Over half of its 5,000 students and academic staff are from outside the United Kingdom. Five of its former staff members have won Nobel Prizes and its Journal of International Studies Millennium enjoys a wide circulation and recognition. So we'll talk more about this coming up in the second hour. This is, this is, we're getting into how the socialists infiltrated both the left and the right and it formed these secretive groups so that no matter who you vote for or what side of the left or right phony thus clever right paradigm you're on, you get socialism. Second hour around the corner, folks. Stay with us. Here you can get 128K archives and 128K live stream of all the great shows here on the network. If you'd like to support what I do with my show itself, filmmaking, and uh, 22 hours of radio a week, theglobalreality.com. That's www.theglobalreality.com. We have a chip and banner up there on that site as well. So you know, if you want to support the network, if you want to support what I do, that's how you do it. We appreciate all of you who have support us. All of our networks, all of our AIM and FM affiliates out there who get us out and on the airways, we salute all of you. And what we're talking about right now is the socialist infiltration of, of the Republican Party. And really how this idea of, of world international socialism has, has been the predominant idea of the New World Order. This is how, why it's so frustrating that you see people that can't understand that George W. Bush set the table with his version of socialism that he's now setting the table for, he set the table for Barack Obama to bring in. And this whole infiltration of the Republican Party in the, in, in the right started in the 1980s with the formation of the Council for National Policy and specifically with the Reagan administration. Now, uh, Michael Vell Doug Owen had on Paul Craig Roberts on the show one time, and I happened to call in and asked Paul Craig Roberts, you know, why he was a member of this group. Why should we believe anything that he says? When he was a member of this Council for National Policy. Now, I'm going to tell you something. He got scared. If you had never heard that show, <laughs> I mean, this guy literally, I think, went, went to the bathroom in his pants. I mean, he literally, he changed his story about eight times. They completely dropped it and moved, moved on to other subjects. Twenty minutes later, he comes back and he starts wanting to ask questions again. And then, and then at the end, he's like, well, let me ask you a question. You don't think I'm a bad guy because I'm a part of this group, do you? I mean, just real shady about it. Like, like, dude, if there's nothing to it, just drop it, let it go. But, I mean, he kept going back to it, and he was like, well, I, I'm not a part of it. Okay, yeah, I was a member one time. No, I don't know what the group is. Well, it was a support group for Reagan. That's what it was, huh? A support group for Reagan? You must have information none of us have, because we that's not, I mean, that's a, that, <laughs> I've never heard that. Uh, you know, I mean, he just went on and on with it, just changed his story after story and was just uh, was visibly shaken. And then he tried to spin it. Because Michael Vale said, you know, he, he said, well, I wasn't I was, you know, I was a member for a period of time in the 1980s and that was it. And then Michael Vale said, uh, no, actually, sir, uh, you were a member in 1996. As late as 1996, you were a member. So to say that you were just a uh a member in the 1980s, Mr. Roberts, is that that's a lie. And then he tried to spin it and say, well, you just said that, that they don't release their membership list. Ah, nice try, buddy. He's like, oh, you said you got my name on a list. Well, how do you have a list? Because they, they don't release their list, so how do you got it? That, that's a lie right there. No, no, no. No, 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 no. See, everything, nothing past 1999 has been released. Everything up to 99 has been released. Michael Vale was talking about him being a member in 1996, but he didn't stop him from trying to deflect of that attention away from it. But it's a pure gold interview, and I don't know if Michael Vale's listening or if he's up or awake or around or anything, but uh, uh, I, I got to get him to post that in the uh, in the chat room. It's just, it's just pure gold because, I mean, literally the guy was shook, was shook up. Something fierce. And uh, it, one time... Uh, Mike Chambers had on, uh, by the way, Mike Chambers is doing his show, Midnight Rider, over here from midnight to 2 a.m. Central Standard Time. 
right here on Oracle Broadcast now, so we're glad to have Mike on board. But he, he had uh, Jerome Corsi on one time, and I actually called in and asked Corsi, you know, why we should believe anything that comes out of his mouth when he's a part of these secretive groups like the Council for National Policy. And they'll, these people, these members, the only thing you'll notice about the members is they'll never say the group by name. They will never say the group by name, and that, that's one of the rules. They're not even allowed to mention the group by name through you know, on the phone, electronic communication, or anything else. And I guess it's probably because, you know, since they're a 501c3 uh, exemption, and they're not supposed to endorse political candidates, but yet, you know, mainstream media openly admits to them vetting political candidates like Sarah Palin. I mean, they openly admitted, they openly admitted to uh, vetting Sarah Palin. I mean, that was mainstream news about two months ago. I mean, openly admitted to, to vetting Sarah Palin, the Council for National Policy did. So that's what they do. They, they allow all these big corporations to come in and donate money to the group. They fund the group. Then they get a tax break for funding the own group that they set policy in. It's a scam. <laughs> but yeah, Corsion and I called in and said, hey, you know, why are you a member of these groups? And he's like, I'm not a member of any secretive groups. Click. And that was all he would say about it. And then not knowing that you know, Mike Chambers was associated with the Intel tri strike report at that time. Two nights later, Doug Owen and Michael Vell have him on, and this guy's openly bragging to be in, in the Council for National Policy. Jerome Corsi is, and he's talking about how they were going to run him as a presidential candidate this year. And I, I'm not, I'd already known that from, from, from my research, but, I mean, it's totally different when they when they openly admit to it now, isn't it? So, I, you know, I mean, and I went to a conference back in August here in Dallas, uh, Freedom 21 conference. A lot of these scoundrels were there. I got some video footage of them from our film. Phyllis Schlafly. Goodness gracious, folks. Merovinian bloodline on both sides of her family. I, I mean, ooh, I'll tell you about that. It's pure evil. Of course he was there. And, and uh, oh, what's the other guy's name? Dr. Michael Kaufman was there. Wasn't too impressed with him. Larry Pratt was there. Yeah, there's there several of these people. And I had a chance to meet some of these people, actually. And I didn't get any, I didn't get an overwhelming feeling of evil from a lot of them, but I definitely got the idea that, you know how people act when they're pulling a scam? It's not necessarily that they're, that they're really evil or that they're really, you really see that they, you don't really, you're not really afraid of them or scared of them. You could just tell that they have that air about them. Like they don't want you to find out they're pulling a scam. That's what I got from these people, from being around them. They just seem like, you know, you can just tell when somebody's scamming you. You know, that, that was the impression I got. But, of course, you know, I did also get an impression that, like any other group, there's compartmentalization. There's people at the lower level and there's people at the higher level. I think that some people probably get involved in the Council for National Policy. Uh, I think some of these people probably get involved in the group thinking that they're going to be able to get their issues to some of the higher ups in the political spectrum. But that's still not an excuse. You know, if you willfully sit at the same table as Ashcroft and Alberto Gonzalez and Bush, and you willfully sit at the same, you know, table as DuPont and Rothschilds, who have also been members of this group, then, you know, I'm sorry, I don't care. And I, and I said, yeah, Dr. Stan, you know what? I don't like Dr. Stan because... Everything he he talks about Freemasonry, it's all it's all Luciferian devil Satan worship. That's all it is. And I think he's a gatekeeper just as much as any of the rest of them are. I also think that uh, uh, people like, you know, Chuck Missler is another one. I mean, Chuck Missler is another guy, Council for National Policy, who a lot of Patriot Movement people have, have always been into. But let's continue here with this uh, information concerning the socialist infiltration of both parties. Pearson, the, the London School of Economics also provided consultants to many organizations, including the UK government, international bodies such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and the United Nations. The Ford Foundation, which funds and whose members have served as trustees on the Council on Foreign Relations, provided a grant in 1967 to the London School of Economics for a Center for International Studies. The European Institute of the LSE participates actively in the European Science Series conferences 
on issues concerning the European Union. In his book, The Committee of 300, former British MI6 officer John Coleman revealed that a high-level Fabian Society member and agent of the Tavistock Institute also managed the Heritage Foundation. And you go, you know, I mean, go look into, if you don't know about the Heritage Foundation, you need to look into them as well. My goodness. The Heritage Foundation is racist eugenics. I mean, that's exactly what it is. And of course, people like Sean Hannity are members of the Heritage Foundation. They'll have Heritage Foundation links all over his website. <laughs> that's just good stuff, isn't it? it, it so, I mean, a, again, a high level Fabian Socialist Society member. An agent of the Tavistock Institute was a manager of the Heritage Foundation. <coughs> and yet Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and all these people are Heritage Foundation members. It's a socialist organization. But yet all these people on the on the right, on the alleged right, are members of this? Huh. Well, what does that say? As you see, you, uh, hopefully you're starting to understand this now. Is that the... the "Quote unquote right that it says that it calls everyone a communist and everyone a socialist are socialists. I mean, <laughs> I, I know that's hard to wrap your mind around, but th this is what they this is what they are, and they're deflating attention from the way or away from the fact that world international socialism is the main ideology of the new world order. But then the Heritage covered its fascist tracks on other occasions. Roger Pearson's tenure on the Heritage Policy Review editorial board was short-lived due to a Washington Post expose of the racist and fascist undercurrent of the World Anti-Communist League, chaired by Pearson in May 1978. Dr. Coleman's remarks are worth including as supportive of other sources which locate the origins of the right-wing Council for National Policy in the British Roundtable and Fabian Society, which has the reputation of being a socialist organization. The Committee of 300, through its many affiliated organizations, was able to nullify the Reagan presidency. Now, this is important information right here. Here is what Stuart Butler of the Heritage Foundation had to say on the subject of the right. Uh, uh, on the subject, the right had thought it had won in 1980, but in fact, it had lost. What Butler was referring to was the situation in which the right found itself when it realized that every single position of importance in the Reagan administration was filled by Fabianist appointees recommended by the Heritage Foundation. Butler went on to say that the Heritage would use right-wing ideas to impose left impose left-wing radical principles upon the United States, the same radical ideas which Sir Peter Vickers Hall, top Fabianist in the U.S. and number one man at Heritage, had been openly discussing during the election year. And that's it right there, isn't it? Every, think about that, ladies and gentlemen. And think about how many people you've heard in the Patriot community, people like... That have been involved in the in the that were involved in the Reagan administration. Think about it. Think about think about the Patriot movement, and think about how many people that you know of that have ties to Reagan. And then think about this: every single position of importance in the Reagan administration was filled by Fabianist socialist appointees recommended by the Heritage Foundation. Meaning, any and all parties involved in the Reagan administration were agents of the Fabian Socialists. Now, in, 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 in a lot of people are probably, this is probably going in one ear and out the other, I understand. Because a lot of people don't want to accept this. The bottom line here is, folks, is that we bought another box. We bought another lie. The whole Patriot community was completely created as a control valve. I mean, one of the most telling things to me that I found in my research for this film was the Project Megiddo documents. Project Megiddo was a pre-Y2K FBI operation. It's now been declassified. And in, if you go read the Project Megiddo documents, they talk about rounding up Christian right-wing militia members who believe in a UN-led New World Order takeover that's going to occur at the turn of the century. And it talked about going and identifying these people and rounding them up and putting them into camps. Now, I know two of two people who were on the air prior to Y2K 
spouting this madness about trying to get fear-mongering people that the government was about to lock down the country and there was it was going to be the takeover. One is very obvious. The other one was Chuck Missler. So don't you find it a bit coincidental and a bit convenient that you have this pre-Y2K document of them talking about wanting to round up these people, but you have people that are on the air trying to get these people up in arms to identify them? I mean, you see where we're at here now, folks? This stuff can't be denied anymore. We're on the other side, Tuesday edition of the Global Realities. Folks, stay with us. And so let's finish talk. Let's let's continue to talk about the British eugenics, the Fabian Socialist Roundtables, and how socialism created groups like the Council for National Policy. Although the Fabian Society has a reputation of being a pioneer of the 19th century socialist movement, the Fabians were neither right nor left wing, but were elitists. Very key. Very key right there. The Fabians were neither right nor left wing, but were elitists. The Fabian Society was founded in 1883 by members of the Society for the Psych Psychiatrical Research, which was a creation of the Cecil Block of the Rhone's Round Table. A brief history of these immensely influential organizations will show how the parent organizations of Great Britain masterminded and modeled the very sophisticated dialectical operation which their progeny are now perpetuating worldwide. Those in whose purview is the control of information about the religious right must stop all investigation at the point where the Rockefeller or the Nazis or the CIA are identified as the culprits. Think about that. Those in whose purview is the control of information about their religious right must stop all investigation at the point where the Rockefeller or Nazis or the CIAs are identified as culprits. You see, that's exactly what the quote-unquote patriot movement does. It stops all the investigation, stops at the point where you either identify the Rockefellers or the Nazis or the CIA or the Bilderberg group. Once they're identified as the culprits, it stops there. You notice that? Have you noticed that? You see, think about it. Oh, it's the Rockefellers, the Nazis, or the Bilderberg Group, the CIA, and that's who's behind everything, and that's it. At all costs, the point of origin must not be identified as Great Britain. However, the proper place to conclude our inquiry is to identify the British societies, which have reproduced their counterparts in the U.S. Among these, they have also planted organizations for the purpose of indoctrinating Christians to look somewhere out there for the conspiracy while they are being ushered into the New World Order via the back door by their leaders. That is one of the most important statements I think that there is. The point of origin must not be identified as Great Britain, you see. These planned organizations like the Council for National Policy and the John Burstein and the others have been created for the purpose of indoctrinating the Christians to look somewhere out there for the conspiracy while they're being ushered into the New World Order via the back door by their leaders. Just that, I mean, my goodness, folks. I mean, that is it. That is one of the best ways of summing it up right there that I can, I can really say. Because, look, I mean, how many people, let me ask you this. How many people in, in, in the 9-11 in in Truth Movement know what the Center for Strategic International Studies is? How many people in the, in the Patriot Movement know what the Heritage Foundation is? How many people know what the Pioneer Fund is? How many of these people even know about the Fabian Socialists? How many of these people have even read Carol Quigley's Anglo-American Establishment? Not too many, but they'll be happy to talk to you all day long about the melting point of steel. They know all about that, don't they? You see... There's a reason, and I'm not hating on any of that stuff. I'm not hanging on the Nine Eleven Truth Movement or any of that stuff. I'm not hanging. I'm, what I'm saying is, you see where this brick wall of information, where you're only allowed to know certain aspects. You see, they'll know everything to know about the Bilderberg Group, but they won't know anything about any of these other groups. Why is that? Because it's an intentional blockade of information. Great Britain functions in a caste system which values heredity above all else. Research on heredity as the determining factor of successful living is common in English and Scottish academic institutions. Interlocking families of high social rank have considered themselves to be the saviors of mankind. 
Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh universities have especially been the province of the sons and daughters of the elite, whose parents belong to the upper echelon of British society. The intellectual capital of these universities and their elite societies would find a way to eliminate the human weeds and populate the earth with a race of thoroughbreds. Terms invented by the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, who frequented the eugenic societies of Europe and Great Britain in her heyday of Rockefeller-funded racism. One of the early pioneers of the 19th century spiritualist inquiry was the Ghost Society at the University of Cambridge. In 1851, Arrowed White Benson, who would later become the Archbishop of the Canterbury, founded the Cambridge Ghost Society, the Society for Psychiatric Research, in an outline of the history of the life of Edward White Benson. His own son, Arthur Benson, documented the distinguished founders of the Cambridge Ghost Society. We'll talk more about this on the other side, and uh, we'll continue with our uh, discussion here of the socialist infiltration of both parties and how everything is controlled, folks. More on the other side, Tuesday edition of the Global Reality. Stay with us. All right, back on the Global Reality. This is the Oracle Broadcasting Network, and I'm your host, Josh Rees. Thank you for being with us today for the show. Talking about the Fabian socialists, the socialist movement, how they infiltrated the left and the right and created groups like both, I mean, as we talked about earlier, they created both the Council on Foreign Relations and the Council for National Policy. So, you know, you, you can't really, uh, you know, say that uh, one group is more powerful than the other. In fact, you know, when I first found out about the Council for National Policy from Professor Peter Dale Scott, who was the first guest I ever had on my program, the second show I ever did. And this is, I mean, this is somebody who, you know, 20, 30 plus years research into the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, someone who's written books extensively about these groups. And so, you know, it was, it was really a, uh, a shock for me to hear him say that there was actually a group out there that was more powerful and more secretive than, uh, than the uh, Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. So immediately when he said that, my ears perked up, and he said, you know, it's this group of Council for National Policy. They control things like Blackwater and the military-industrial complex and and uh, they, you know, the Knights of Malta, and they work on behalf of the Vatican and the Christian Zionists, and and the, and, the, and the whole New World Order complex. And then you find out all this stuff, start seeing all these connections to these Patriot community people, and you start going, "Oh, wait a second here, you know, we bought another lie, we found another box, we found another, we bought another control valve, we bought controlled opposition, and that's what we did, and we all did, and we all bought it, so." We can all accept and we can all accept the fact that we did do that and move on. Let's continue. The Fabians. In 1881, Frank Podmore, who joined the early Sedgwick group, met Edward Peace at one of these spiritualist seances that were the vogue in London, at which they became close friends. The next year, he invited Peace to attend a meeting of his group in which the SPR was formed. Norman and Gene McKenzie rec record this meeting in their history of the Fabians. The members membership of the Fabian coefficients demonstrates that the Fabian society was neither a socialist or a conservative society. You have to understand that. But an elitist front for British oligarchy world rule. The coefficients included several men who also belonged to the inner circle of the Rhodes Roundtable, groups that were under the direction of Alfred Milner, Sir Edward Gray, Halden, L.S. Amory, Lord Robert Cecil, Lord Arthur Balfour, Michael Sadler and Lord Milner himself were among the Fabian coefficients. The coefficients club was organized by Beatrice Webb, the co-ruler of the Fabian society with her husband, Sidney Webb. To bring together most powerful movers and shakers of the British establishment with social critics and idealists to discuss and chart the future of the British empire and its relationship to social reform. Uh, that's so funny. She's uh, side girl says, Josh, don't forget about the brilliant writer George Bernard Shaw and his friends Beatrice and Sidney Webb. Right as I'm right as I'm talking about that, right as I hit the point where I'm talking about the, the coefficients club organized by Beatrice Webb. Great timing there. Uh, synchronicity abounds. <laughs> right as I'm right as I'm mentioning it, uh, you, you say that. Uh, of course, the coefficients club was organized by Beatrice Webb, co-ruler of the Fabian Society with her husband Sidney Webb, to bring together the most powerful movers and shakers. 
or the British establishment and social critics. Among other things, the accounts of the deliberations offered by such luminaries as Bertrand Russell and H.G. Wells prove beyond any doubt that Fabian socialism, contrary to service impressions, that it was the enemy of the British oligarchy, was one of the oligarchy's most prized instruments for world rule. Coefficients included Sir Edward Grey, Hadland, Bertrand Russell, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, Leo Max, Clinton Dawkins, Carlin Belairs, Pembert Reeves, W.A.S. Hewins, L.S. Amory, H.J. McIndoe, Lord Robert Cecil, Lord Arthur Balfour, Michael Sadler, Harry Newbert, Lord Milner, John Hugh Smith, J. Birchendow of the City, Garvin, Josea Wedgwood, John Hugh Smith, and others. Wells and other ideal idealists argued that the British Empire had to be the precursor of a world state or nothing. The Cecil Bloc became an increasingly powerful political force, among, and among them, Sir Edward Grey and Hanlon, who were Fabian coefficients, also were strong imperialists, supported the Boer War, grew increasingly anti-German, supported the World War in 1914, and were close to the Milner group politically, intellectually, and socially. Bertrand Russell warned the coefficients that Lord Grey's proposals would lead to a war and tyranny. When his objections were overruled, he left the club. In 1902, I became a member of a small dining club called The Coefficients, got up by Sidney Webb for the purpose of considering political questions from a more or less imperialist point of view. It was in this club that I first became acquainted with H.G. Wells, of whom I had never heard of until then. His point of view was more sympathetic to me than that of any other member. Most of the members, in fact, shocked me profoundly. I remember Amory's eyes gleaming with bloodlust at the thought of a war with America, in which he said with exultation, we should have to arm the whole adult male population. One evening, Sir Edward Gray, not then in office, made a speech advocating the policy of intenti, which had not yet been adopted by the government. I stated my objection to this policy very forcibly and pointed out the likelihood of its leading to war, but no one agreed with me, so I resigned from the club. I will be seen, it will be seen that I began my opposition to the first war at the earliest possible moment. Cecil Rhodes' Secret Society had taken form in 1891. The same year, Rhodes drew up his fourth will and made his chief confidant, W.T. Steed, and Lord Rothschild the trustee of his fortune. Lord Rothschild was entrusted with by Rhodes to handle the financial investments associated with the trust. Steed and Rhodes divided the Secret Society into two circles, the inner society of the elect and the outer circle, the association of helpers. To Lord Rothschild, Rhodes revealed the plan for the Society of the Elect, which included Arthur Balfour within its circle of initiates. As Foreign Secretary in the administration of Lord George, Arthur Balfour issued the Balfour Declaration in 1970, which addressed to Lord Rothschild, states that Britain would regard with favor the establishment of a national home for the Jews in Palestine. Although Balfour penned and signed the document, Quigley asserts that he was not the author. But, in fact, Lord Milner was. The declaration, which was and is always known as the Balfour Declaration, should rather be called the Milner Declaration. Since Milner was the actual draftsman and was apparently its chief supporter in the war cabinet, this was not made public until July 21st, 1936. At that time, Ormsby Gore, speaking on behalf of the government in common, said the draft, is, as originally put up by Lord Balfour, was not the final draft approved by the war cabinet. The particular draft asserted, assented by the war cabinet and afterwards by the Allied governments of the United States and finally embodied in the mandate, happened to have been drafted by Lord Milner. The actual final draft had to be issued in the name of the Foreign Secretary, but the actual draftsman was Lord Milner. Balfour and Rothschild were also members of the mysterious Apostles Club, to which the infamous Bible revisers Westcott and Hort and Henry Sedgwick of the SPR belonged, an important fact which has been obscured by the Zionist crusaders, including those in the Council for National Policy. And that is that the plan for the state of Israel was formulated in the secret societies of Britain. Yes, 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 that is it. The, the agendas of the Zionist Crusaders, including those in the Council for National Policy, that the plan of the state of Israel was formulated in secret societies of Great Britain. That's indeed it. That's why do you think you have Hagee and you have all these people like and Jerome Corsi? We're all pro-Israel, folks. Why do you think this is all involved in the Council for National Policy? Why do you think this, that is why? Because that has been part of the plan for decades. We'll finish this up, talk more on the other side. Third hour of the Global Reality right around the corner, folks. Stay with us.
Third hour of this Tuesday edition of the Global Reality right here on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. I'm your host, Josh Reese. Thank you for being with us today. You know, this this conversation started today, and uh, it, the reason this started is because we had this article. I don't know if you guys have seen this uh, yet, but I, I played it. If, if you didn't tune in at the beginning of the show today, uh, article today, Jeb Bush says that the uh, uh, they, that the government should create a shadow government to focus on policy. And I'll put that link in the chat room for you. There's an audio clip there of Jeb Bush saying that. And, uh, you know, saying that, the, that the, the Republican Party should create its own shadow government to focus on policy. And, and I was they're saying, well, they already have done that. So this is what led me into this uh, conversation today about the Council for National Policy and about how the socialists have created all of the movements and how, I mean, this is one of the, this is the New World Order. I mean, this is the whole key aspect of it. And, and why this gets left out predominantly in uh, New World Order research <laughs> speaks for itself. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's a reason why. Why do you think you haven't heard this talked about on other radio shows? Well, it, it really just answers, that question answers itself, doesn't it? Because it was set up by these groups. Again, you know, this is why you have all these you know, Christian Zionists and these Opus Day members and everything else in this group. The use of the propaganda was one of the Milner's group's cheap weapons to achieve its ambition. The Federation expansion and consolidation of the British Empire. In 1994, Steed discussed with Rhodes how the secret society would work and wrote about it after Rhodes' death as follows. We also discussed together various projects for propaganda. The formation of libraries, the creation of lectureships, the dispatch of emissaries on missions of propaganda throughout the empire. And the steps to be taken to pave the way for the foundation and the acquisition of a newspaper which would be devoted to the service of the cause. This is the exact description of the way in which the society that is the Milner Group has functioned. One of the chief methods by which this group works, has been through propaganda. It plotted the Jameson Raid of 1895, it caused the Boer War of 1899-1902, to 1902, and it set and controls the Rhodes Trust. It created the Union of South Africa in 1906-1910 and established the South African periodical The State in 1908, and it founded the British Empire periodical The Roundtable in 1910. And this remains the mouthpiece for the group. It has been the most powerful single influence in All Souls, Balliol, and the New Colleges of Oxford for more than a generation. It has controlled the Times for more than 50 years, the Times of London. And it publicized the idea of, in the name, British Commonwealth of Nations in the period of 1908 to 1918. It was the chief influence in Lord George's war administration in 1917 to 1919 and dominated the British delegation to the Peace Conference of 1919. It had a great deal to do with the League of Nations of the System of Mandates. It founded the Royal Institute of International Affairs in 1919 and controls it. It was one of the chief influences on British policy towards Ireland, Palestine, and India in the period between 1917 and 1945. It was a, it was a very important influence on the policy of appeasement of Germany during the years of 1920 to 1940, and it controlled and still controls to the very considerable extent the sources and the writing of the history of the British in imperial and foreign policy since the Boer War. Now, folks, why do you think someone like Poppy Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, why do you think George Herbert Walker Bush was initiated into the Order of the Garter by the Queen of England? Go type in the Order of the Garter and go do some research on the Order of the Garter. The Order of the Garter is a precursor to being brought in as a member of the Committee of 300. And the, the only way that you get a designation into the Order of the Gardener is through service and servitude to the crown, to the Queen of England. And George Herbert Walker Bush was made a member of the Knights of the Garter. And I think one of the, I think it was it Prince William, I think it was recently, uh, earlier this year, made a member as well. Well, that's very telling as far as, you know, what you understand, because... Uh, you know, the Reagan administration and the Bushes, this is, you know, these tentacles have been extended all through this for decades. The Royal Institute of International Affairs 
is nothing but the Milner's group writ large. It was founded founded by the group and has been consistently controlled by the group and to this day is the Milner group in its widest aspect. The real founder of the Institute was Lionel Curtis. The Institute was organized by a joint conference of British and American experts at the Hotel Majestic on May 30th, 1919. We've already indicated that the experts of the British delegation at the Peace Conference were almost exclusively from the Milner Group in Cecil Rhodes Block. The American group of experts, the inquiry, was manned almost completely by persons from institutions, including universities, dominated by J.P. Morgan and Company. This was not an accident. Moreover, the Milner Group has always had very close relationships with the associates of J.P. Morgan and with the various branches of the Carnegie Trust. These relationships, which are merely examples of the closely knit ramifications of international financial capitalism, were probably based on the financial holdings controlled by the Milner Group through the Rhodes Trust. The term international financier can be applied with full justice to several members of the Milner Group inner circle, such as Brand, Hitchens, and above all, Milner himself. At the meeting at the Hotel Majestic, the British group included Lionel Curtis, Philip Kerr, Lord Robert Cecil, Lord Eustace Percy, Sir Ear Crow, Sir Cecil Hurst, J.W. Headlam, Morley, Jeffrey Dawson, Harold Tipperley, and G.M. Gathern Hardy. The British organization, the, R- R- the RIIA, was set up by a committee of which Lord Robert Cecil was a chairman. Lionel Curtis was honorary secretary. According to coefficient H.G. Wells, the method by which England would acquire world domination was through the agency of the transnational corporations. Wow. So H.G. H. G. Wells was quoted as saying the method by which England would acquire world domination was through the transnational corporations. Here's the quote from H.G. Wells. Wells was one of the few socialists who claimed to... Oh, I guess we don't have the quote. Oh, yes, we do. He's down here. Wells was one of the few socialists who claimed to see big business and multinational corporations in particular as the forerunners of a world socialist state. In any case, Wells effectively described the policies in most respects still being effectuated by the Anglo-American elite. In his Confession of Faith, Cecil Rhodes defined the nature of the group he envisioned would circumvent the current political system to carry out his dreams as described by Milner. Again, Cecil Rhodes defined the nature of the group that he envisioned would circumvent the current political system. This system was set up to circumvent the left and the right, folks. It was created to make sure that socialism gets in on either side. Men of ability and enthusiasm who find no suitable way to serve their country under the current political system. Able youth recruited from the schools and universities. Men of wealth with no aim in life. Younger sons with high thoughts and great aspirations, but without opportunity. Rich men whose careers are belighted by some great disappointment. All must be men of ability and character. Rhodes envisaged a group of the ablest and the best, bound together by common unselfish ideas of service to what seems to him the greatest cause in the world. There is no mention of material rewards. This is to be a kind of religious brotherhood like the Jesuits, a church for the extension of the British Empire. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? There is no mention of material war. This is to be a kind of a religious brotherhood like the Jesuits, a church for the extension of the British Empire. That is what Cecil Rhodes described his the, the Rhodes Roundtables and the Fabian Socialist Movement as, folks. I mean, my goodness. Do you need more proof? During the 30-year period in which B.F. Westcott and F.J.A. Hort labored in the creation of a new Greek Testament, In revision of the English Bible, they also founded and guided organizations dealing in matters of occult and conspiratorial. Now, why would they do that? Why would a group who's trying to infiltrate both the left and the right, why would a group who's trying to create gatekeeping societies that keep grassroots movements like, you know, like a patriot movement from starting up, why would these people that revise the English Bible also found and guide organizations dealing in matters of the occult and conspiracies. Now, we're talking about 60, 70 years ago. 
But what is exactly like that in our modern day that we know of? Well, the Sumner Institute of Linguistics here in Dallas, Texas, where I live, which was funded by Nelson Rockefeller and was a Council for National Policy-owned group, guess what they did? Well, they went to Latin America in the 1980s with Bibles and spread Christianity at the barrel of the gun, and the death squads and Latin American death squads ran by Poppy Bush, Reagan, Larry Pratt, and others went down there and spread Christianity at the barrel of the gun while at the same time having groups like the John Burt Society and others that put out, you know, books and, and, you know, none dare call it a conspiracy and things like that about conspiracies. People like Chuck Missler of the CMP putting out things about the occult. You see where this is going? You see how this was created long before what we know about in the modern day, folks? Absolutely bombshell information, folks. I mean, this is, (laughs) oh, man. I just hope that, that at least some people will start to understand this. They labored in creation of a new Greek testament and revision of the English Bible, but they also founded and guided organizations dealing in matters of the occult and conspiratorial. The secret societies they founded were intimately interlocked with and in some cases had direct influence on the power elites who laid the groundwork for the Federation expansion and consolidation of the British Empire, and by extension, a one-world government. The progeny of West Scott and Horse includes not only the multitude of modern Bible revisions based upon corrupt manuscripts, but also the Society for Psychiatrical Research which investigated and established the principles of modern spiritualism and psychology, the Fabian Society, which collaborated with the Rhodes Society, and founded the London School of Economics and Political Science. To deny the connection between Westcott and Hort's revision of the received Greek text, using Gnostic manuscripts and their deep involvement in occult sciences, is to pretend not to see the obvious. In order to move the world into an anti-Christian New World Order, the British elites needed to gradually replace the authentic English Bible with a counterfeit reflecting their own belief system. This is exactly what the Sumner Institute of Linguistics here in Dallas, Texas has done. By the way, it's got a pyramid on top of it. Carrying forward the Cambridge New Testament scheme, members of the Rhodes Roundtable and the Council for National Policy have produced Bibles based on the corrupt Westcott Hort Greek Testament for global distribution. Carol Quigley noted that John Buchan, (coughs) who was close to Lord Milner, eventually became a partner for the publishing firm of his old classmate, Thomas A. Nelson, which is based in dun-dun-dun, Edinburgh, Scotland. Buchan was not a member of the inner core of the Milner Group, was close to it, and was rewarded in 1935 by being raised to the barony as Lord Tweedesmeyer and sent to Canada as a governor general. He is important because he is, with Lionel Curtis, one of the few members of the inner circles of the Milner Group who have written about it in a published work. In his autobiography, Pilgrim's Way, he gives a brief outline of the personnel of the kindergarten and their subsequent achievements in a brilliant analysis of Milner himself. Buchan went to Baranos College, but, as he says himself, I lived a good deal at Balloil, and my close friends were of that college. He mentions of his close friends, Hilar Balak. Buchan went to South Africa in 1901 on Milner's personal invitation to be his private secretary, but stayed only two years. He left in 1903 to take an important position in Egypt. This appointment was mysteriously canceled. It is likely that Milner changed his mind because of Buchan's rapidly declining enthusiasm for federation. The Thomas Nelson Publishers website provides a brief reference concerning Buchan's contribution to the company, naturally omitting mention of Buchan's membership into the Cecil Rhodes Roundtable. In the early years of the 20th century, the business was being managed primarily by George M. Brown, Thomas Nelson's son-in-law, and John Buchan, a noted novelist of such popular works as Prester John and 39 Steps. Prester John. Didn't we talk about Prester John and something else? Recently, biographer and political correspondent John Buchan, a close friend of Tommy Nelson, became instrumental in expanding the company's offerings of classic works and educational resources. Thomas Nelson is today one of the largest and one of the oldest Bible publishers in the world and leading publisher of religious books. Thomas Nelson also takes credit for the debut of the New Testament of the Rise Standard of Revision in 1946. I mean, this is unbelievable unbelievable stuff. I mean, this is the whole essence of how the Council for National Policy was created. It's been going on for a hundred plus years. 
And this is just the modern day incarnation of it. Wow. Unbelievable stuff. More on the other side, Tuesday edition from Global Reality. Folks, stay with us. All right, back here on the Global Reality, ladies and gentlemen. Tuesday edition of the show, and I am your host, Josh Rees, and I thank every one of you for being here with us today for the broadcast. And, of course, you know, uh, this is important information. And uh, I'm really happy that uh, a lot of you are, are, are getting it. <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll put that one. I'll put that one on my. Uh, I'll put that one on, uh, on my list of, of films to make there, uh, green. It. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean this is important information. I'm glad that a lot of you get it and understand it, um, because again, why this information about the Fabian Socialists and why the Milner's Roundtables and these groups. Why this information has been left out of the realm and scope of this type of information for a period of time, I think it becomes very obvious in and of itself. It really explains itself. You know, I mean, again, why do you think that, that, oh, yeah, and of course, Nelson Mandela, yeah, I understand. Old Buckle Rhodes would be laughing in his grave to see how Nelson Mandela has put up a South African CP to work for the Empire. Well, of course... Well, yeah, of course, and, and, and Nelson Mandela is a Knights of Malta uh, is a Knight of Malta, as well. Now you have all these Council for National Policy people; they're Knights of Malta. Pat Buchanan, you've got uh, oh, there's tons of them. Of course, uh, Phyllis Schlafly is the only Dame of Malta, the only living Dame of Malta. They very rarely make females Knights of Malta. When they do, they call them Dames of Malta. But uh, yes, Nelson Mandela, yeah, of course. Of course, it see it all ties in, ladies and gentlemen. All it's all net wrapped up for you. In nineteen seventy six, Nelson Publisher initiated the new King James Bible version. Two meetings of the North American Overview Committee met at Nashville and Chicago in nineteen seventy five to assist in preparing guidelines for the NKJV. Members of that committee in a Nashville convocation in nineteen eighty four included the following high profile members of the Religious Roundtable and the Council for National Policy. Tim LaHaye, D. James Kennedy, Jerry Falwell, Ben Hayden, Mary C. Crowley, W.A. Criswell, E.V. Hill, Henry Morris, Bill Bright, and Charles Stanley. Unholy Hands on God's Word is a transcript of a 1996 radio interview of Judy... Pat- <coughs> Excuse me. Of Judy Penatala, who describes the composition of the new King, King James Bible translation review committees, which included several members of the CMP, and other Reconstructionist organizations. In this presentation, Judy demonstrates the the Dominionist slant of the NKJV. The big problem with these counterfeit Bibles is not only the expunging of verses, but the altering of verses. If you take a look at the backbone of this political movement, the Reconstructionist social gospel they use from the modern NIV and the New American Standard out of Matthew 28 They have altered the Great Commission. This is where I think one of the great delusions, the Great Deception has come in, the modern versions, the corrupt versions. It says that the Great Commission is to therefore go and make disciples of all nations. This is the verse that they use to justify taking turf and setting up the New World Order. In the King James Bible, the correct translation of that verse is, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. In other words, the Great Commission was to preach the gospel. It wasn't to take numbers. It wasn't to take disciples. It was to take nations, take turf. That is how they've used the modern version to corrupt the doctrine and to create this heretical position that is going on today. So on these Bible committees are men who have other agendas. Corrupted versions of the Bible were also used by the Rockefeller-funded Sumner Institute of Linguistics based in Dallas, Texas, to facilitate the takeover of Latin America. Instead of translating the Bible literally, All this information I'm talking about right here with SIL is going to be in my film, The Secret Right. SIL preferred a method of translation called dynamic equivalency. And again, to facilitate the takeover of Latin America. Facilitate the takeover of Latin America. This is where the Latin American death squads that Larry Pratt and others were involved with, folks, comes into play. And you see how it began with these Spavian socialists? You see how this began a century ago? A method of translation called dynamic equivalency, which permitted the translator to alter the language of Scripture, ostensibly to adopt Scripture to the culture. 
Two well-known examples of dynamic equivalency are today's English version, Good News for Modern Man, and the Living Bible. In 1975, John Beacom, translations according to Wycliffe Bible International, gave his unreserved endorsement of the Living Bible, which is a mere paraphrase of the Word of God. The Living Bible is the most readable and the most natural English translation available. The authors of Thy Will Be Done suggest that as SIL created written languages for illiterate tribes, it changed words that had warlike connotations in order to pacify those tribes that would otherwise oppose their new masters. The implication is that this practice was carried over into SIL's transi translation of Bibles. An incurable ecumenicist, Towns' admiration for a Catholic priest indicated that linguistics was used to neutralize resistance among the Indian tribes of Latin America. I am a loving fundamentalist. I believe in working with anyone who will help get the Bible to the Indians. One of the heroes whom I admire the most for is the celebrated father Bartolome de las Casas. This worthy Dominican, as well as, as well as all remember, made use of the sacred history in the Indian languages of Guatemala in order to draw the Indians to the faith and to peace. We too, so insignificant in comparison with that great hero of the cross, can indeed follow his example as regards of the use of linguistics. Incredibly, the Wycliffe Bible translators, who were trained in modern anthropological methods and linguistics, were employed by Nelson Rockefeller and the CIA to gather anthropological and psychological information on Latin American tribes. In return, Wycliffe was recompensed with land, high-tech equipment, and expensive airplanes, courtesy of the American government and corporations. SIL helped gather anthropological information on the Tarascon Indians that ended up in Nelson Rockefeller's intelligence files. The files contain references to reveal behavioral patterns among Indian people and everything from socialization, including aggressive tendencies and personality traits, drives, emotions, and language structure to political intrigue, kinship ties, traditional authority, mineral resources, exploration, and labor relations. Rockefeller called these data the strategic index of Latin America. The indigenous peoples of Latin America did not subvert their own governments, but rather the American robber barons overthrew legitimate governments and then used Wycliffe Bible translators to bring native populations into subjection. Through misapplication of scripture, Cam Townsend taught Latin American tribes to passively accept the overthrow of their governments and to submit to the puppet dictators installed by the multinational corporations. This is all going to be uh, exposed, folks, in my film, The Secret Right. Boy, this is amazing stuff. More on the other side, Tuesday edition of the Global Reality, folks. Stay with us. I'm going to the show. I'm going to talk. Thank you for being with us today for the broadcast. We're talking about the now Milner's Roundtable, the Fabian Socialists infiltrated both the left and the right and created groups like the Council on Foreign Relations and the Council for National Policy. And this is a very key piece of my research that I'm going to be covering in my new film, The Secret Right. By the way, if you'd like to donate to the creation of that film, um, and uh, we've, we've got some donations in. We've gotten a lot of what we need to get it gone. Uh, we're almost a little bit, just a little bit shy. We've got a chipping banner up at thegoalreality.com. If you'd like to donate, that's where you can do it at. And uh, your support is vitally necessary. Because it's going to end up being two films. You know, it was going to be one film. Now it's going to be two films. The Secret Right and The Secret Right 2. And those will come out about three or four months apart from each other. And uh, right now I'm, I'm in the process of learning some brand new video editing software that is like basically having to start all over again from scratch. Oh, I feel like such a noob learning this software, but it's going to be worth it. And I just got a, a, a big book on, on how to use it because, uh, I mean, this is going to be the difference between it looking like, uh, you know, just another internet film and uh, actually looking like a professional film. And Lee Rogers and I are actually in the process of uh, acquiring some actual licensed footage for this film. So it's not going to be just a collection thrown together. YouTube clips, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be, you know, a, a real professional looking film. And we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to get it out there. I try, I plan on uh, trying to get it into some film festivals and whatnot as well. So uh, it's going to be great. TheGlobalReality.com. But uh, this is one of the things, the, the Center for uh, the SIL, the Sumner Institute of Linguistics, it's here in Dallas, Texas, where I live. And this is where, with the Wycliffe Bible Translators, they printed these twisted and contorted Bibles that they used as a pretext to take over Latin America. The indigenous peoples of Latin America did not subvert their own governments. 
but rather the American robber barons overthrew legitimate governments and then used Wycliffe Bible translators. No, it's uh, Avid, Avid Studio, uh, Avid Media Composer. The indigenous people of Latin America did not subvert their own governments, but rather the American robber barons overthrew legitimate governments and then used Wycliffe Bible translators to bring native populations into subjection. Through the misapplication of scripture, Cam Townsend taught the Latin American tribes to passively accept the overthrow of their governments and to submit to puppet dictators installed by multinational corporations. The Sumner Institute of Linguistics was hired by military dictatorships and civilian governments, often headed by Nelson's allies, to pacify the tribes and integrate them into national economies increasingly brought into the North American market. SIL used the Bible to teach indigenous people to obey the government, for all authority comes from God. So this is what your wonderful Council for National Policy has been up to, folks. Believe that? This is what your wonderful patriot movement is all about. Using the Sumner Institute of Linguistics in Dallas, Texas to use the Bible to teach indigenous people to obey the government because all authority comes from God. That's just good stuff, isn't it? The beast out of the final statement of this is called the beast out of the sea. And I stood upon the, the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power. It's, it's always dragons and reptiles, isn't it? And his seat and great authority. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted upon the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of its four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. The interpretation of the hybrid beast of Revelation 13, 1, 2 is based on Daniel 7, 3, 6. As the beasts of Daniel 2 were world empires, a reasonable exposition of Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 exposes the final beast system as comprised of movements in the last days will successfully attempt to achieve world domination. The symbolism given in Scripture precisely applies to the great movements of Anglo-American imperialism, communism, and fascism. The royal arms of England displays the rampant lion made to stand upon the feet of the man in the unicorn. And so they're using these interpretations that they use in the Bible. You see, this is the interesting thing about it. Is they're taking these these twisted interpretations of the Bible and they're they're using their exactly, Preston. Exactly. That's exactly what they're doing. You see? They, they're, they're using the things out of the Bible and coding it into their plan. Exactly. Exactly. You got it. There it is. There it is, Preston. You nailed it. That's exactly what it is. They're coding it. They're using little hints out of the Bible and coding the plan into it. My goodness. I see far, how far down the rat hole we are now. Cecil Rose derived his concept of the round table from the legend of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, which is based on the Gnostic myth of the Holy Grail. Lord Alfred Tennyson was a contemporary of Cecil Rhodes and a member of the Society for Psychiatrical Research. The Spiritualist Church for Intellectuals, founded by the Cecil Block, Tennyson's re reference to the healing of Arthur's mortal wound is a symbolic prophecy of a future revival of the Gnostic Grail cult, which was subdued by the Roman Church. It is not unreasonable to assume that demonic entities from the spirit realm with whom Tennyson communicated inspired his writings and in turn influenced Cecil Rhodes' socio-political aspirations. King Arthur's dying words explain why the Scottish Stuart crest displays a phoenix with a motto, Courage gains strength from a wound. The Stuart clan is believed to be a sacred family of the Merovingian bloodline who were kings of France from about 448 A.D., until they were replaced in 800 A.D. by Charlemagne, who the Roman Church appointed as Holy Roman Emperor. 
the Merovingians present an imposter as rightful rulers of Europe through the Davidic lineage of Jesus Christ and will position themselves to rule the world from the throne of Jerusalem. And that's, of course, why you have uh, Phyllis Schlafly, who's a Merovingian blue blood on both sides of her family, and she's involved in all these groups as well. You see, they believe, again, again it goes back to what we talked about last week, about the, or earlier, about this divine right to rule. We talked about that on Saturday night here. If you didn't hear my Saturday night show, go back and listen to it. We talked about the divine right to rule. That plays right into this. It's all a part of it. Ed McAteer's religious roundtable, which was extended to include secular globalist organizations and the 500-plus member Council for National Policy is a modern-day version of the roundtable of the King Arthur and Cecil Rhodes. To camouflage its real origins in Arthurian lore, the latest amalgamation of pseudo-Christian organizations by that name rests the word of God to conceal its pagan origin. The Great Commission Global Roundtable resulted after joint meetings of the World Evangelical Fellowship in August in Dallas, in August of 2000 in Dallas and earlier in Norway, picked the name Great Commission Global Roundtable to emphasize obedience to Christ's mandate to evangelize all peoples in another around the table of the Lord. Wow. So they used all this. In final analysis, the Council for National Policy as an extension of the Religious Roundtable is a joint venture of pseudo-Christian ministries, cults, secret societies, subversive organizations, and corporate enterprise working together to exploit Christians to advance their anti-Christian agenda, Anglo-American imperialism, and ultimately one world government under a one world religion their own. This is, I mean, it, it, we'll talk more, we'll finish up, and then we'll get into news in the fourth hour around the corner, folks. This is The Global Reality. Stay with us. Take it back. Oh, All right, back here on the global reality on this Tuesday edition of the broadcast. I want to finish up with this information on the Council for National Policy and the, and the infiltration of uh, world international socialism on, on both the left and the right. This has never been more important than it is now, ladies and gentlemen, because we, we're now being able to, you know, we've lived long enough to see this. We've now seen that George W. Bush, through his controllers, that started in the Reagan administration even before that, but really, as far as the Council for National Policy goes, it, it, this has been, that was really the genesis point for what we see now. And all the subsequent I I administrations, folks, from Reagan to Poppy Bush to Clinton to George W. Bush and now to Barack Obama, all these Clinton people involved and these are these, you know, insiders in there, this plan has continued on unimpeded. Unbelievable stuff. Profiles of other prominent Council for National Policy officers and members reveal a shocking number of CFR connections, such as the aforementioned William Rushner, who was editor of the CFR member William F. Buckley's National Review. Even so, these revelations should not be surprising since the CMP was an extension of the John Birch Society, whose early leadership consisted of members either directly or indirectly associated with the CFR. In 1976, the Belmont Brotherhood an expose published by former JBS officers identified the following glaring conflicts of interest. William Greedy, founding JBS council member and chairman of the executive committee of the council, was also director of the CFR, created and controlled 7th Federal Reserve Bank. These are all Council for National Policy JBS members who were also involved in the Council on Foreign Relations. William Benton McMillan, first life member of the John Burke Society, but also a member of the St. Louis Committee of the Council on Foreign Relations. Robert Waring Stoddard, John Burt Society Council member and chairman of the board of the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, whose editors belong to the local committee of the Council on Foreign Relations. Stoddard was also on the board of directors of the National Center of Privatization. J. Nelson Shepard, John Burt Society Council member and a member of the Newcomen Society, whose president, Charles Penrose Jr., was also a member of the Pilgrim Society and the English-speaking union, whose elite membership included Paul Warburg, J.P. Morgan, John W. Davis, Bernard Broch, Otto Kahn, Jacob Schiff, and John D. Rockefeller, to name a few, founded and financed the Council on Foreign Relations. Spruell Braden, the John Burr Society Council member and resident member of the Council on Foreign Relations and director of the W. Avril Harriman Securities Corporation and advisor to Paul Warburg, a principal architect of the Federal Reserve System. Louis Ruthenberg, John Burr Society Council member and director of the Federal Reserve Bank in St. Louis. 
Cola Godden Parker, John Burt Society Council member and a member of the Newcomb Society, whose president, Charles Penrose Jr., belonged to the Pilgrim Society and the English speaking Union. You see how we've been led to believe that in the Patriot community that the John Burt Society is somehow a part of it. No, they expose the CFR, but yet they're all involved with the CFR and they're all John Burt Society members. Yes, Baldwin was in the was on the campaign trail with with uh, Ron Paul the whole time. Actually, Chuck Baldwin actually admitted that on a third party roundtable on C-SPAN. Uh, if you go and get the video of that that I, I saw it live, but there's yeah there was a third party. A couple weeks before the elections, there was a third party roundtable uh, with all the third parties, and Ron Paul was there, and uh, Cynthia McKinney and Nader, and Chuck Baldwin. It was on C-SPAN, and he admitted there uh, just prior to praising. Jerry Falwell, he admitted that he was on the on the bus the entire time with uh, with Ron Paul. Uh, Cola Godden Parker, John Burr Society Council member and member of the New Newcomen Society, whose president Charles Penrose Jr. belonged to the Pilgrim Society. Martin J. Condon III, John Burr Society non-council member who was on the editorial advisory committee of the American Opinion Magazine and member of the Newcomen Society. Howard Phillips. Howard Phillips, another person who endorsed Ron Paul and also endorsed Chuck Baldwin. Howard Phillips, head of the U.S. Taxpayers Party, the Conservative Caucus, and appointed many YAF members while acting director of the Office of Economic Opportunity under Richard Nixon. Richard Vidry, who with Weyrich, Phillips, Blackwell, Falwell, and McAteer founded the Moral Majority, was the executive director of YAF from 1961 to 1964, Besides CFR and religious roundtable members, the upper echelon of the Council for National Policy were basically refugees from the defunct Western Goals Foundation, the domestic surveillance outfit of the John Burt Society, which included high-ranking members of the fascist World Anti-Communist League, the Knights of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, the Unification Church of Sung Young Moon, and Freemasonry. There is some overlapping of the Western Goals operatives who formed the early CMP governing board who were also CFR and other religious roundtable members. John K. Singla, CMP Board of Governors, 82 to 83, member of the National Policy Board of the American Freedom so Coalition, a front for the Sung Young Moon's Unification Church. Daniel O. Graham, CMP Board of Governors, 82 to 83, member of the National Policy Board of AFC. Mildred Faye Jefferson, CMP Board of Directors, 82 to 83, member of the National Policy Board of AFC, served as advisor to Chile's regime under Augusto Pinochet, and reportedly worked closely with Chile's secret police organization, DINA. My goodness, Larry McDonald. Larry McDonald, president of the John Burt Society, chairman of the board of directors of Western Goals Foundation, served on the Congressional Board of Christian Voice for the Unification Church. Nelson Bunker Hunt, CMP president, 82 to 83, executive committee, 84 to 85 and 88, Knights of Order of Malta. Member of Racial Eugenics Organization, the International Association for Advancement of Eugenics and Ethnology. This was headquartered in Scotland. It was established by the U.S. Lord Malcolm Douglas as a member of the British Clydeness that was supported Hitler during World War II. Oliver North, former the Military Assistance Group and Special Operations and Political Murder Unit, participated in Operation Phoenix, which killed about 100,000 civilians in Southeast Asia. North received aid from the Unification Church and the Knights of Malta for Contra operations in Latin America. We're going to finish this list up here. And then we'll get into news in the fourth final hour of this Tuesday edition of the Global Reality, folks. Stay with us. Back here with the reality, fourth hour of this Tuesday edition of the broadcast. I'm your host, Josh Rees, and I thank you for being with us today for the show. I want to finish up talking about this information on the Council for National Policy and how these are tied into the John Burr Society, the Council on Foreign Relations, and others. These are members I'm reading you now, and I'm telling you about uh, their uh, connections. Larry McDonald, CMP Board of Governors, 82 to 83, President of the John Burr Society, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Western Goals Foundation, and served on the Congressional Board of the Christian Voice, a front for the Unification Church. Nelson Bunker Hunt, Knight of the Order of Malta, member of a racial eugenics organization, the International Association for the Advancement of Eugenics and Ethnology, that was headquartered in Scotland. And these people had a meeting, folks, the Clint Murchison meeting, the night before Kennedy was assassinated. They had it here in Dallas, Texas at the Hunt's house. This is where Nixon and, and all the other cronies talked about, got together and talked about the killing of Kennedy. 
Oliver North formed the Military Assistance Group Special Operations, the MAG-SOG Political Murder Unit, and participated in Operation Phoenix, which killed about 100,000 civilians in Southeast Asia. North received aid from the Unification Church of the Reverend Sung Young Moon and the Knights of Malta for Contra Operations in Latin America. Howard Phillips, director of the Conservative Caucus, served on the advisory board of the United States Council for World Freedom of the World Anti-Communist League, a multinational network of Nazi war criminals, Latin American death squad leaders, and North American neo-fascist conservative caucus board member and funder Richard Schaff is a former grand kill grab of the Indiana Ku Klux Klan. Major F. Andy Messing, Jr., former chairman of the conservative caucus board of the U.S. WCF, director of the National Defense Council Foundation, collaborated with Linda Gill of CASA, and its head, Bohai Pack, to provide funds for Oliver North's operation in Latin America. J. Peter Grace, Council on Foreign Relations, head of the Knights of Malta in the U.S., chairman of W.R. Grace Company, which focused its business activities in Latin America and assisted Contra operations in Latin America. W.E. Simon, Council on Foreign Relations, Knights of Malta, Council for National Policy, Secretary of Treasury under Richard Nixon. Chairman of the Nicaraguan Freedom Fund, a fundraising organization set up in 1985 by the Washington Times, a newspaper owned by the Unification Church of Reverend Sung Young Moon, trustee of the Heritage Foundation. According to Sidney Blumenthal, Simon is or was a member of the CMP. Frank Shakespeare, Knights of Malta, Council for U.S. Information Agency, Director of the Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, a Nazi front established by Hitler's espionage officer, Reinhard Gellin, trustee of the Heritage Foundation. And again, go get, I challenge you to go get Russ Balant's book, The Chorus Connection. He has all this laid out. Some of this information is 20-plus years old, folks. Dr. Edward Teller, Council for Relations, Hungarian-born American psych uh, physicist who became the architect of the hydrogen bomb during the World War II. He was a member of the Manhattan Project for the development of the atomic bomb. Teller was a member of the Citizens Legal Defense Fund for the FBI, ad hoc, and advisor to the Western Goals Foundation. It is significant that Nelson Bunker Hunt, the founder and main funder of the Wycliffe Bible Associates and the Council for National Policy, like many founding CMP members, is a Knight of the Order of Malta. According to Russ Ballant, although it poses as a Catholic organization, the Order of St. John of Jerusalem is a Masonic group that claims to be the real Knights of Malta. Its Grand Master for 50 years until his death several years ago was Charles Pickle, an advisor to Hitler aide Ernest Havingstaff. Occupying position in McAteer's Religious Roundtable, 33rd degree Mason Jesse Helms was also a key figure in the founding of the Council for National Policy. With his top aide, Attorney Tom Ellis, Helms had put together a national political machine that was unprecedented for the ultra-right. Tom Ellis, who directed the agency which funded racial science for the purpose of eliminating inferior races, was president of the CMP after Tim LaHaye. Tom Ellis was former director of the Pioneer Fund, a foundation which finances efforts to prove that African Americans are genetically inferior to whites. Recipients of the Pioneer grants have included William Shockley, Arthur Jensen, Roger Pearson, who has written that inferior races should be exterminated. All three and others were funded during Ellis's directorship on the Pioneer Board, yet Ellis served on the CMP's 13-member executive committee with Holly Coors, Paul Weyrich, and the Heritage Foundation president, Edwin Fuelner until June 1989. Oliver North and Reed Larson recently joined the executive committee. With the help of the Vigery Company, with Richard Vigery, Jesse Helms, and Tom Ellis's organization, the Congressional Club, funded candidates and solicited support on favorite issues through direct mail campaigns. Helms' popularity increased during the Reagan era when ideological conservatism experienced a resurgence at the same time traditional values of fundamental Christians were under siege. The National Congressional Club is Jesse Helms' PAC based in Raleigh, North Carolina, and directed by Helms' senior advisory attorney Tom Ellis. The Congressional Club began after the 1972 Senate campaign when Ellis retained Richard Vigory to help pay off Helms' campaign debt. Ellis and Vigory built the Congressional Club mailing list to more than 300,000 regular contributors, a constituency for Helms, and a major financial resource within the conservative movement. Helms has used his political organization to build connections with the new right 
and conservative political activists. Does that sound familiar? Besides Vidry, Phillips, and Dolan connections, Helms is actively represented in Waverton's coordinating groups. Helms is the chief legislative strategist for the conservative social agenda. Helms also occupies a central position in the religious right as a member of the Religious Roundtable, a lay preacher and a former radio and television evangelist. Interesting stuff there, ladies and gentlemen. Very, very interesting. Now ask yourself why it took myself and others to bring this information to you. How? Ask yourself why this hasn't been brought out anywhere else. And we're going to finish up talking about the CMP in this segment. Then we're going to get into news in the final five, 45 minutes of today's broadcast. Hostility to the Constitution's separation of church and state is the defining feature of the religious right. The religious right is reacting to what it perceives as a moral and social crisis allegedly brought about by U.S. Supreme Court rulings in the past 50 years. The movement's central issues are abortion, homosexuality, fem feminism, evolution, school prayer, school curricula, and school choice in the media. Learning from the organizing eras of the 1980s, the religious right of the 1990s had been successful in organizing at the local level. Ralph Reed, executive director of Pat Robertson's Christian Coalition, told the Washington Post on March 14, 1990, the Christian community got it backwards in the 1980s. We tried to change Washington when we should have been focusing on the states. Well, I've got a pure gold clip of Phyllis Schlafly that, uh, that I shot at the uh, Free, uh, Freedom 21 conference I went to back in August. And she literally says, ladies and gentlemen, that we have taken, she says, quote, we have taken over politics before and we will do it again. I actually got Phyllis Schlafly on tape saying that. It's going to be in my film, The Secret Right. <laughs> oh, man. You can imagine me sitting there about to just tear my skin off when she was saying it. I was going, oh, man, pure gold. I'm just sitting there with the camera just full, full, you know, full shooting like, it's, like it ain't no thing. I didn't even have a press pass or anything. I'm in the front row, man. There she is. <laughs> we tried to change Washington, but we should have been focusing on the states. The real battles are concerned our Christians are in neighborhoods, school boards, city councils, and state legislators. Tim LaHaye of Concerned Women for America told Christianity Today in the 1990s, the religious right was composed of a host of independent, locally sponsored and funded work in unison. LaHaye's prophecy has come to pass. Under the umbrella organization, the Council for National Policy, the radical right has been extraordinarily effective in realizing its political agenda. Its secretive membership... Its secretive membership... No, I'm not going to put the clip up now. <laughs> if I want to... Yeah, if I want to put the clip up now, what would be the whole point of me making a film? No, I'm not going to put the clip up now. <laughs> you have to wait till the film is out. Geez, everybody wants everything for free. <laughs> I spent $5,000 on my last film, maybe I got 600 bucks, and you want the clip now? No. <laughs> this film's going to exceed that cost, and everybody's going to want it for free. I mean, how the hell do you think we're supposed to do more stuff if everybody wants everything for free? I'm sorry it has to be like that, but my God, where do you think this money comes from? I don't live below the poverty line to do this just, for, just to give it all away, folks. I don't make $250,000 a month doing it like some of these Council for National Policy cronies do, okay? Thank you. Its secretive membership boasts anti-abortion crusaders, gun rights proponents, religious crusaders, anti-tax advocates, financiers, policy open mention this past. The CMP newsletters take credit for everything. Kill health care reform to blocking regulations. Personal group founded in 1980 and only. Including senators, congressmen, and leaders of almost every national radical right group. to blocking regulations restricting religious expression in the world. take credit for everything mentioned this past August. The CMP newsletters take credit for everything from helping to kill health care reform to blocking regulations restricting religious expression in the workplace. The CMP, a nonprofit tax exempt educational group founded in 1981, has more than 500 members who were admitted by invitation only, including senators, congressmen, and leaders of almost every national radical right group, among them CMP President. Attorney Ed Meese, the Reagan administration's attorney general, Christian Coalition founder Pat Robertson, Christian Coalition executive director Ralph Reed, and the U.S. taxpayers' parties. Look, 
I know, and I know that's what you're talking about. Yes, you know what? I don't care. If you don't like it, don't listen to my damn show. We have a we have a chat room like this so I can participate. If it derails and I talk, then I'm sorry. It's duly noted. That's kind of what the thing about my show is, is that the chat room is a part of it. So if you don't like the way that it derails, I'm sorry. That's part of it. It's always been a part of it, and I'm not going to change it now. CP President Ed Meese, the Reagan administration's attorney general, Christian Coalition founder Pat Robertson, and Christian Coalition executive director Ralph Reed, the U.S. Taxpayers Party founder Howard Phillips, gun owners of America head Larry Pratt, radio talk show host Oliver North, and direct mail wizard Richard Vidry, and Amway Corporation founder Rich DeVos and members of the Coors family. CMP member groups carve out distinctive niches. CMP member Reverend Don E. Wildman's American Family Association, based in Tupelo, Mississippi, founded in 1977 as the National Federation for Decency states that it is a quote-unquote Christian organization p- promoting the Bible ethic of decency in American society with primary emphasis on TV and other media. The CMP member Phyllis Schlafly's group, Eagle Forum, founded in 1972 based in Alton, Illinois, led the fight to defeat the Equal Rights Amendment. CMP's members Beverly and Tim LaHaye group Concerned Women for America was founded in 1979 in San Diego, California, and moved to Washington, D.C. in 1985. Its stated purpose was to preserve, protect, promote traditional values. Of course, if you go read the uh, Reverend Doomsday article, just type Tim LaHaye, Reverend Doomsday, Rolling Stone magazine. I'll put it in the uh, chat room for you. They openly talk about it in that Rolling Stone magazine article about how LaHaye started out as this anti-Illuminati conspiracy theorist. And then he founds the group that, that just happens to spawn the Patriot Movement, this guy that started out as a John Burke Society conspiracy theorist. And he just happens to create a group called the Council for National Policy that, that spawns the Patriot Movement, spawns all these other people. Hmm. Seem a little bit suspicious to you? CMP member James Dobson's group, Focus on the Family, founded in 1977, is based in Colorado Springs, Colorado. According to Christianity Today, Focus on the Family is the number one ministry in the U.S. by income. Its 1995 budget was $101 million, much of which, which went to producing 10 radio programs and 11 magazines. And, of course, James Dobson has taken funding from the Reverend Sung Young Moon. All of these people have taken funding from the Reverend Sung Young Moon. This guy, Sung Young Moon, claims that he can talk to uh, dead people through this spirit machine that he has. You know what? There, there's a guy, and I've got to get him on the program. I got a an a, a advanced copy from his uh, publisher, but there's a guy, John Gornfeld, who wrote this book, Bad Moon Rising, about the Reverend Sung Young Moon. He made this little video. I should play this for you on the other side of the break. But literally, the Reverend Sung Young Moon claims that he has this spirit machine that he communicates to the spirit world with, and that past dead presidents like Abe Lincoln and others have given uh, him their endorsement from the grave and that they've claimed that the Reverend Sung Young Moon is actually the Messiah. Literally. And this is the guy who funds the group with all these patriot community people in it. we got to play this. We're going to play something again on the other side of the break. This is pure gold. It's a short little uh, documentary on, uh, called The King of America. Uh, created by John Gorenfeld. We'll play that on the other side of the break when we come back here in this final hour of the Global Reality right here on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. And I am your host, Josh Reed. Stay with us. Josh, please not be with us today. Okay. We've been talking about the Council for National Policy today. I want to play you John Gorenfeld's The King of America, short little 18-minute documentary on the Reverend Sung Young Moon. It starts out with this audio clip you'll hear. It's a gentleman talking. And you can't see the text. What it is, the first thing you're going to hear when this clip starts is a, a text, an audio uh, translation of a text transcript that, a, that allegedly uh, is President, I think it's Roosevelt, from the grave giving his endorsement of the Reverend Sung Young Moon. This guy claims that he communicates with dead president and they endorse him from the grave this is this is this is the guy that funds the council for national policy in the entire republican right in this country folks unbelievable stuff here it is 
when I listen to lectures on Reverend Moon's divine principle and unification thought here in the spirit world, I was so moved that I feel an ever-growing urge to be resurrected on earth every day. This is where it all happened. On March 23, 2004, your elected officials took a break from authorizing Iraq war funds to crown Reverend Moon, the King of Peace. He put on majestic flowing robes and wore a golden crown and announced that from beyond the grave, dead presidents of the United States had endorsed him as the Messiah. Let's take a look. King, some young moon. <laughs> After Salon.com broke the story last week, some of the very embarrassed lawmakers in attendance claimed they were duped. I'm John Gorenfeld, and I broke that story. It took the New York Times and the Washington Post three months to catch up with my blog. And when they did, the Times editorial board compared the cult ritual to an act of the Roman emperor Caligula. Roscoe Bartlett, six-term Republican congressman from Maryland, brought Moon his robes and said after the event that he had no idea what was going to happen. Danny Davis, veteran Democratic congressman from Chicago, brought Mrs. Moon her crown and said he was just there to celebrate world peace. I've just written a book because I thought maybe it said something about how crazy our politics have become when congressmen bow down to a foreign cult leader and no one seems to care. Moon publishes a powerful newspaper, the Washington Times, He's given a ton of money to the religious right, and he calls our country the kingdom of Satan. This isn't a conspiracy theory. It isn't even a theory. Just the story of a really rich guy who thinks he's the Messiah and his absurd relationship with America over the past 40 years. In the 1960s, when South Korea was still a poor, war-torn country, the factory owner who called himself Moon was considered ridiculous. Moon said Jesus had asked him as a teenager to save the world. But Koreans accused Moon of running an X-rated church where you could be born again by sleeping with six women. In 1965, he came to America and found himself right at home as the 60s turned into something creepier, the 70s. The new wave of cult leaders made vague, empty promises of peace and universal harmony but often had other motives. These pictures were taken just hours after the mass murder-suicide and bodies litter the ground. A barrel containing cyanide-laced Kool-Aid. Tape recording from the SLA. Mom, Dad, I'm okay. I'm with a combat unit that's armed with automatic weapons. By 1979, a mother's worst nightmare was that her kids would join one of the strange new groups and one of the strangest was the Moonies. Moon said he was here to unify the world's religions. He said his mass weddings, like this one at Madison Square Garden, could cleanse mankind of sexual evil left over from the Garden of Eden. He wanted to breed a glorious new race, born without sin, under the guidance of his philosophy, the divine principle. He was widely considered a dangerous lunatic, but he believed he could charm America. So he dressed up his followers as revolutionary war heroes and pioneer women and put on huge bicentennial rallies in New York and Washington. Flags and patriotic music would warm up the audience and then Moon would take the stage and deliver a raging, nearly incomprehensible speech about Adam and Eve, God and Satan, and the coming Korean Messiah. Moon became a pop culture icon. Good evening. I am the Reverend. We have come for the girl. This kid's going back to her family. Why do you resist us? It is so much more pleasant to surrender and become one of us. Submit to the unavoidable. Free yourself of human emotion. 
Why not come to our bicentennial rally? You're crazy! You think this isn't really a joke. There were hundreds of accounts in the press of young people who said that the Moonies had manipulated them into selling flowers and trinkets for Moon. Parents hired deprogrammers to ambush their lost children and bring them back, no questions asked. He also caught the attention of Congress. A House panel, shown here interviewing Moon's right-hand man, Bohe Park, concluded that the Moon organization was determined to gain power in Washington. Moon tried things like sending pretty female followers to Capitol Hill to soften up resistance. When that didn't work, he hit on his best idea yet, to start a newspaper for the new Reagan conservatives. The Washington Times published its first issue in 1982, and today it still has national influence. The paper often starts questionable stories that are then picked up by Bill O'Reilly, Rush Limbaugh, and others on the right, and move into the mainstream. Some of its greatest hits are Michael Dukakis was mentally ill. Bill Clinton might have been an agent of influence for the KGB while traveling as a Rhodes Scholar. Saddam's weapons of mass destruction might have been moved to Syria. And the Minutemen were a huge army massing at the border with 16 airplanes, when in fact, there were never more than 200 people. This election season, Moon's Insight magazine published a story that's become an email favorite on the right an absolutely untrue report that Barack Obama went to school at a hardline Islamic madrasa. Whenever the Washington Times throws parties to congratulate itself for all this, there's the risk of two worlds colliding. On the one hand, conservative Republicans who love what the paper does. Nor All right, so we'll stop there right there. We'll pick that up on the other side. It's says, uh, the Reverend Sung Young Moon, it says, John Gornfeld's little documentary, The King of America. We'll finish this up on the other side, right here on the Gulf of Reality on this Tuesday edition, folks. Stay with us. Whenever the Washington Times throws parties to congratulate itself for all this, there's the risk of... Whenever the Washington Times throws parties to congratulate itself for all this, there's the risk of two worlds colliding. On the one hand, conservative Republicans who love what the paper does. Normally, when I think of the Washington Beltway press corps, I think of, well, not going to say it, wouldn't be prudent. But when I think of the Washington Times, I think of a publication that has brought much needed balance to the way Washington is covered these days. On the other hand, there's Reverend Moon. Men's sexual organs for the sake of a woman. A woman's sexual organs are shaped as concave and convex. Why are they shaped that way? Absolute sex is centered on God, and free sex is centered on Satan. History, historically, world literature, and... In 2000, when Moon purchased the legendary wire service, United Press International, Helen Thomas quit rather than work for him. Today, UPI is a shell of its former self. Moon may not dominate the headlines like he used to, but these days his empire of influence peddling has become vast and far-flung, stretching from New York to Latin America to the Pacific Islands to Japan and Korea. In the heart of Manhattan is the New Yorker Hotel. It's an Art Deco landmark that Moon bought in 1976, closing it to the public for about 20 years and renaming it the World Mission Center. During the high-pressure heyday of the cult, Several members fell to their deaths from its heights. Moon tried to improve his image by sending his followers out from the hotel with big brushes to scrub New York clean. The hotel is now open to the public again as a Ramada Inn with Mooney offices upstairs. How long is he in there? He's running like almost 20 years, right, sir? Do you ever see it? Is it really as a penthouse? I've heard that he has a penthouse. He has a lot of things up the So he, he stays up there and uh, the whole floor. You guys aren't Moonies. Are you a Moon? No. You're not, you're not a cult member. <laughs> He's the cult judge. I used to be. You used to be in, in the Moonies? Next door is the Mooney-owned Manhattan Center Studios, which includes the famous concert venue, the Hammerstein Ballroom. Moon's other holdings would take all day to list. The cult has diversified into a staggering number of businesses, fake world peace groups, 
and faith-based front organizations that have received literally millions of dollars in dubious federal cash from the Bush administration. In this building in upstate New York, we found the global headquarters of Moon's Universal Peace Federation, one of his interchangeable front groups run by the same people and often with the same phone numbers. A post-it note on the door of one group, Wango, said that if no one was around, they'd go down the hall and knock on the door of the so-called Interreligious and International Federation for World Peace. For an organization with a budget of $13 million a year, not much seemed to be happening here. Jumping on the Republican abstinence education money train has also been profitable. This Say No to Sex group, Free Teens USA, uses Moon's own words in public schools. In 2005, it received over $790,000 in federal funds, added to the $1.8 million it had received over the previous four years. Free Teens tells kids to say no to free sex. It's run out of a guy's house in New Jersey, and it's unclear just what it's done with the millions of dollars it's been awarded since 2001. True love! True love! Repeat after me! True lie! True lie! True lineage! True lineage! For these kids, free sex is a matter of life and death. These are the children of the mass weddings, the second generation. Bred by Moon to live perfect lives, they're told that a single sexual mistake will ruin all of their father's work. As a, as a girl, you must protect your organs, such as your breast, your love organ, and so forth, because they have to be kept intact for the sake of your coming children in the future. Moon lives in suburban New York, where the Rockefellers are his neighbors. He has two adjacent mansions, Belvedere and East Garden, which is named for the Garden of Eden. Our attempt to visit East Garden didn't last long. Shazoom. Turn that off for a minute. Right turn is it? That's the, uh, excuse me. Oh, it's off, it's off. Farther north into the Catskills, we drove to Moon's Training Institute along the Hudson River. I'm here in upstate New York at the Unification Theological Seminary. It's, a, it's an old Catholic monastery, actually, that the Reverend Moon bought. Had it converted, uh, he had had the uh, cross removed from the steeple, and the, uh, the Virgin Mary apparently got evicted. Um, the idea was that it was distracting people from worshiping Moon instead of Jesus. Um, and now you can come here and get your religion degree, although, uh, frankly, it's kind of a little bit creepy. This barn looked like something out of a David Cronenberg movie. And this converted altar room seemed like it would have been more at home in Children of the Corn. The state of New York has officially designated this walk through the woods near UTS as Father's Trail, named for Moon, who calls himself the true father of humanity. But if you don't want to schlep all the way upstate to learn about the divine principle, you can take classes at UTS Midtown. The school is located at the New York City headquarters of the Moonies, a few blocks from Grand Central Terminal. Upstairs is a dormitory for the missionaries, who spend 18 hours a day on the streets begging pedestrians for cash. The Moon Cult is organized under the umbrella of the Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity, which has recently received over $300,000 from the Homeland Security Department, supposedly to repair boats. We went to Queens in search of the Reverend Moon's most amazing project, a company he founded for the express purpose of building a machine to talk to the dead. He calls it the World Research Institute for the Study of Technology, or RIST. The company listed an address here in this building, also a printing plant for the Segye Times, his Korean language newspaper. But when we got to the Segye Times building, we were told that RIST had relocated to California. But Moon's agenda isn't just supernatural. Years ago, he told his followers of plans to become the Ocean King, to build boats, to catch tuna, and to deliver seafood all around the U.S. His plan has been wildly successful. In 2006, the Chicago Tribune discovered that most American sushi restaurants are supplied by Moon. His conglomerate, True World Foods, stretches from Alaska to Alabama. It's been accused of filthy work conditions, poaching, and threatening FDA inspectors with divine retribution for trying to do their jobs. Although Moon laid low for much of the 90s, recently he's scrambled into action. 
He's apparently trying to fulfill his prophecy that his religion will make Christianity obsolete. The Washington coronation was just part of an ambitious international campaign to convince ministers to junk the Christian cross and adopt the crown of moon as their new symbol of worship. Here's what the Unification Church had to say about the Tear Down the Cross tour. In an historic speech in May 2002, Reverend Moon shared the painful heart of Jesus over his tragic rejection and persecution and challenged Christian leaders to take the crosses down from their churches and unite the children of Abraham. The revolutionary, the revolutionary movement will take place. All the cross on, the, on top of the churches should be... Surprisingly, Moon met with some success on an unlikely tour of black churches in the U.S. All right, so there you go. So that's really all the time we have to play that. But uh, go to VO.com. You can go to my MySpace, myspace.com forward slash global reality show. It's on the left-hand side of the screen there. You can watch that video. Very interesting stuff there, ladies and gentlemen. Final segment, news boats around the corner for you. This is the Global Reality. Stay with us. Final segment of this edition of the Global Reality Radical Broadcasting Network. I am your host, Josh Rees, and I thank you for being with us today for the show. We, you know, we've uh, had quite a uh, quite an interesting show today, and it really started out from this uh, story that I had. It just sort of spawned into a uh, whole show on the CMP and the socialist infiltration of both the left and the right, and how all these people get funding from the Reverend Sung Young Moon. But uh, Jeb Bush, there was a story that came out today where George Bush said, uh, Jeb Bush rather said that uh, the Republican right should create a shadow government to focus on policy. So that really spawned me into a whole thing of, well, they already have. But it's a nice way to do it. You know, a couple of weeks ago, there was a meteor uh, that crashed over Canada. And we saw a video of this. Scientists find meteor debris in Canada. Scientists said Friday they have found remains of a meteor that illuminated the sky before flying to Earth in western Canada earlier this month. Interesting that I didn't find out about uh, until about two days after that. I was outside of my, my, my job at the night that this happened. It was about 8 o'clock at night. I'm here in Dallas, Texas. Folks, I saw this gigantic. It was, I, was facing, I was facing due north, too. That was a crazy thing. I saw this gigantic, and I mean gigantic bright green streak comes streaking across the sky at about 15 seconds. I mean, for about 15 seconds, I mean, it was huge. I mean, it freaked me out. I mean, I didn't know what I was like, oh my God, is this blue beam? Or I didn't know what the hell it was, man, because it was, I mean, it was bigger than anything I've ever seen, dude. I mean, it was streaking across the sky. The front of it was green, but then it had like white and red trailing behind it. It just looked insane. It just went all the way across the sky for a good 15 seconds. Then I found out a couple of days later that this was it. I, I, I have no doubt that this was either uh, a piece of that or this was uh, it coming over the atmosphere. And maybe because, I mean, I'm in Texas and this happened in Canada, it crashed in Canada, so maybe it was coming through the atmosphere and went all the way down that high up. I mean, it was insane. But it was funny to me to find out that it, right around that same time that it happened was when I had, uh, I had seen that. So very interesting there. Rogers says U.S. is doomed. No, not Lee Rogers. Lee, Lee Rogers will tell you U.S. Is do, dollar is doomed, but so will Jim Rogers. The dollar is doomed, thanks to Washington, says commodities bull Jim Rogers. U.S. government leaders have got it backwards, and their policy risks the dollar long-term role in the world economy. Well, that dovetails with another story that Michael Bell sent me, and I really don't have time to get into it uh, today, pertaining to the Amero. The Amero becomes the U.S. new currency, and the dollar collapses. But I'll put that one in the chat room for you guys to check out. Uh, nonetheless, I don't really have time to get into it. But I'm sure Doug Owen and Michael Bell will get into it today for you on the Intel Strike Report, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Believe in God? Oh, no. But I swear by little green men, ghosts, and mediums. This is from the Daily Mail out of the U.K. today. Believing in ghosts and little green men from outer space appears a touch easier than having faith in God, according to a survey. The researchers found that while 54% of us are convinced the Almighty exists, 58% believe in the supernatural. The findings may be somewhat unsurprisingly and have been issued to mark the DVD release of The X-Files, I Want to Believe, the film stars David Duchovny and Julian Anderson who made their TV series uh, such a success. They play FBI to investigate cases of, that appear to have unexplained paranormal elements. The research put out to coincide with the DVD release also claimed women were more likely to believe 
in the supernatural than men, and were more likely to visit a medium. But, I mean, come on. <laughs> that speaks for itself. U.S. may be in Great Recession longer than post-war. U.S. economy now officially in a recession, maybe in the midst of a longest slump in the post-World War II era, as jobs and credit crisis and the credit crisis dries up. Well, there you go. We've been saying that for how long? That's a Bloomberg article today. Taj Mahal Hotel chairman says, we had warning. And more and more information comes out. We know the whole Mutant, uh, Mumbai thing was, was a total inside job. It, it was a total stage for provocation. I mean, look, go look at, have you seen these pictures of these, the terrorists, the, the shooters? They all had the Hindu red bracelets on, meaning they're from, they're, they're from India, folks. They're not from friggin' Pakistan. The Taj Mahal Hotel in Mumbai, India, had been warned about the possibility of a terrorist attack before a 60-hour rampage began on Wednesday, leaving at least 183 people dead. So they had prior knowledge of the attacks, just like you had 9-11 when certain people were warned not to fly on 9-11 and certain people were warned not to go to work that day. Certain people were warned not to go to the Taj Mahal that day, ladies and gentlemen. That's a CNN News article, and I'll put that one in the chat room for you as well. Unbelievable stuff. J.P. Morgan sees feds cutting rates to zero in January. Well, of course they will. They'll do anything they can to prop up this phony monetary system for as long as they can. Obama says South Asia is chief threat to U.S., solidifying the Eastern Bloc versus the Western Bloc and the two superpower battle for World War III. Russia touts itself as an anti-American world power. More of that. More rhetoric again on the, on the West versus East. Dualistic power zones. New York Post columnist and a former Bush foreign policy advisor warns that the current criminal leadership is trying to extend Russia's sphere of influence beyond Asia, the Caucasus, and Europe. That's a very interesting article. Let me put that one in the chat room for you as well. Lots of good stuff today. Bomb on train kills two in northeast India. This one's gone largely unreported today. There was another bombing today. A bomb exploded in a train coach today in India's insurgency hit northeast, killing at least two people, injuring 30, a state government official said. But you notice how when it's not a, most likely not a state-sponsored attack, it doesn't get any media coverage. But yet the Mumbai thing was blasted all over. This has happened today, folks. A bomb went off on a train in India today. Hadn't seen that all over the news, have you? No, because it was probably actually a real terrorist attack, not something that was created by the intelligence oper operatives. Venezuela proposes new regional currency, new regional currency during ALBA summit. So now not only is the SEO going to create their own currency in their own bank, but now Venezuela is going to create their own currency. That link is in the chat room for you as well. Tons of stuff. Wounded deer attacks Hunter who shot him. <laughs> that one's funny. Uh, group therapy beats depression. All Mumbai government from Pakistan says India. We've already debunked that. Cheney and Gonzalez and Diamonds are dropped. Oh, big shocker there. And think Dick Cheney and uh, uh, Alberto Gonzalez were actually going to get held accountable for anything, do you? Come on. Growing risk of nuclear or biological attack. More rhetoric about possible terrorist attacks. And of course, we're going to see something. The odds that terrorists will attack a major city with nuclear or biological weapons are now higher than ever due to threats from rogue states, nuclear smuggling networks, and the spread of weapons know-how, according to a bipartisan task force created by U.S. Congress, the Washington Post reported today. The more rhetoric there and more ramp up, more fear monger. We'll get into we'll get into this one tomorrow. Dig on Earth Stone Age sculptures. Rare artifacts from the late Stone Age have been un uncovered in Russia. The site at Zarashak, 150 kilometers southeast of Moscow, has yielded figurines and carvings on mammoth tusks. The finds also include a cone-shaped object whose function, the authors report in the journal Antiquity, remains a puzzle. A cone-shaped object, folks. A cone-shaped object whose function remains a puzzle. Remember we talked about all the pineal gland and the cone iconography? We're definitely getting into that one tomorrow. Very interesting stuff. Folks, that's our show. We're flat out of time. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Don't forget... TheGlobalReality.com. We have a fundraiser up there if you'd like to help support us. 
And you can email me at globalrealityshow at gmail.com. My name is Josh Reese. I love each and every one of you. We'll see you guys back here tomorrow for the show. You guys have a great rest of the night. Stay tuned for Alex Dan Curry. Up next. Take care, guys. Have a good one.